Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Denver Regional Council of Governments meeting of the Board of Directors for Wednesday, June 15, 2022. Uh, my name is Kevin Flynn. I am the chair of the board this year. I want to call this meeting to order. We are back to virtual, uh, at least for this month. So thank you, everybody, for your flexibility in, uh, in making this last minute uh, change in direction. Uh, before we do roll call, uh, Melinda, I, I, I'd like to, before roll call, announce the new members that we have and the new alternates. We have two of each. Uh, we have, uh, from the town of Bennett, we have Royce Pindell. And from the city of North Glen, we have Meredith Lighty. Our new alternates are from the city of North Glen, Richard Kondo. And from the town of Georgetown, Rich Barrows. So welcome, everybody. Uh, and... Uh, uh, Melinda, you can now proceed with taking the roll call. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, and just to let everyone know, uh, new and old, uh, obviously we're doing our best to pull everyone over that serves on the board as panelists. Um, and obviously if you're not able to respond when I call your name, we will ask again at the end of roll, uh, just to make sure we didn't miss anyone. All right, and with that, I will go ahead and get started. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Steve Odoricio of Adams County. Yes, this Lynn is Commissioner Baca. Lynn Baca. Yes, here. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, Jeff Baker of Arapahoe County. Uh, Bill Holland of Arapahoe County. I do believe I saw Bill Holland. Maybe he is having technical difficulties, so uh, we'll try and come back. Uh, Claire Levy of Boulder County. Present. William Lindstedt, uh, City and County of Broomfield. I'm here. Randy Wheelock of Clear Creek County. Here. Nicholas Williams, City and County of Denver. Here. George Jill, Douglas County. Here. Webb Sill of Gilpin County. Tracy Kraft Tharp of Jefferson County. Yes. Lisa Smith of Arvada. Here. Allison Coombs of Aurora. Present. My, oh, thank you so much, my apologies. Uh, Royce Pindell of Bennett. David Spellman of Blackhawk. Nicole Spear of Boulder. Junie Joseph of Boulder. Margo Ramson of Beaumont, Jan Klauski of Brighton, Adam Cushing of Brighton, Deborah Mulvey of Castle Pines, here, Jason Gray of Castle Rock, Tim Dietz of Castle Rock, here, Tammy Maurer of Centennial. Present. Cara Tanucci of Central City. Randy Wheel of Cherry Hills Village. Happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Craig Hurst of Commerce City. Susan Noble of Commerce City. Steve Conklin of Edgewater. Good evening. Good evening, Othaniel Sierra of Inglewood. Steve Ward of Inglewood. Ari Harrison of Erie. Here. Linda Montoya of Federal Heights. Here. Don Cognac of Firestone. David Whelan of Firestone. Josie Cockrell of Foxfield. Lisa Here. Jones. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Josie. Thanks. No problem. Lynette Kelsey of Georgetown. Rich Barrows of Georgetown. Rachel Binkley of Glendale. Ryan Tushare of Glendale. Paul Hazeman of Golden. Here. George Lance of Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber of Greenwood Village. Chuck Harmon of Idaho Springs. Here. 
Stephanie Walden of Lafayette. Hello. Jeslyn Sherezai of Lakewood. Here. Stephen Barr of Littleton. Kyle Schlachter of Littleton. Present. Jamie Jeffrey of Lockbuoy. David Ott of Lockbuoy. Wynn Shaw of Lone Tree. Jackie I'm Malay here. of Lone Tree. Oh, there we go. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, Joan Peck of Longmont. Here. Ashley Stolzman of Louisville. Here. Holly Rogan of Lyons. Here. Colleen Whitlow of Mead. David Adams of Mead. Meredith Lighty of Northland. Richard Kondo of Northland. Here. John Dyack of Parker. Here. Sally Daigle of Sheridan. Neil Shaw of Superior. Tim Howard of Superior. Present. Jessica Sandgren of Thornton. I'm here. Sarah Nermella of Westminster. Bruce Baker of Westminster. Bud Starker of Wee Ridge. Good evening, glad to be here. Thank you. Rebecca White of CDOT. Here. Sally Chafee of CDOT. And Bill Van Meter of RTD. All right, and then at this time, um, I'll ask if there's anyone left over in the attendees or anyone on the panelist side who was able to answer during roll and I can read your names off really quickly. Okay, we have Nicole Spear with us this evening. Thank you for joining us. Linda, All right. Oh, Linda, yes. Mayor Lance is also here. Um, I'm trying to bring him over. Okay, uh, George, if you're using dual monitors, uh, there will be a pop-up. It may pop up on the screen you're not focusing on. Uh, otherwise, we can unmute you so you'll still be able to participate uh, during the meeting. Um, so we do have George Lands. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chair, we do have a quorum and I will hand it back to you. Excellent, thank you so much, Melinda. And welcome again, everybody. We, uh, first item of business is to uh, ask for a motion to approve the agenda. And let me uh, take a look at the screen and ask, uh, solicit a motion to approve the agenda for this evening. Who would like to make that motion? I would move no. to approve the agenda for uh, Wednesday, June 15th, 2022. All right, that was uh, Director Harmon and I see Mayor Starker. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll put you down as seconding that. I will second the motion, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, all in favor, I'm, I'm assuming there's no discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? <laughs> thank God. Uh, are there any abstentions? Thank you. All right. Uh, the first uh, item is uh, something that uh, we put at the top of the agenda. This is uh, uh, something that came up during our, uh, our retreat. It's a discussion of economic development district um, to explore the, uh, the possibilities and, and what's involved in uh, Dr. Cog being an economic development district. And we have uh, Flo Raitano from staff. Doug, are you gonna start this off or do we hand it right off to Flo? Let's just go right to Flo. Excellent. Flo, you have the floor. We have two, uh, two guests here, I understand, who are going to present to us. Go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as as uh, Chairman Flynn indicated it, in our retreat on April 2nd, we did introduce the concept of um, exploring the designation of an economic development district for the De Dr. Cog region. And, and there's a, a couple of reasons for that. Tonight is an informational briefing provided by the Economic Development Administration, which is a part of the Department of Commerce. That's, that's the federal side of the house. But, and, and that will be Trent Thompson. We also have Greg Thomason joining us from the Governor's Office of Economic Development and International Trade. And the reason for that is that the, the state is looking at preparing a statewide comprehensive economic development strategy. And in order to be designated as an economic development district, one of the requirements is to go through the exercise of creating a, an economic development 
um, strategy, a, a comprehensive is looking what Dr. Cog to do that. So it then folds up and rolls up into the statewide um, uh, sense. So uh, without further ado, and I'm gonna turn off my camera because my connection is unstable tonight. Um, I'm gonna introduce Trent Thompson from the EDA. Trent and I go back quite a while, uh, quite a ways. We've known each other for a couple of decades, I think, Trent. And, and um, he's here to present that and then following right on, on the heels of Trent's presentation, Greg Thomason from OEDIT will, will present from the state side. Thank, thank you, Flo. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen just so you have a visual as we're uh, talking through this. I just need to uh, pull it up. So you should see a hexagon. Yes, we do. Okay. And do you still see that or do you see the, do I have to you flip need to, it? You need to flip it because we see your notes. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so I'm going to play it a little bit safe here and, and, and first kind of just give a, a very brief EDA, uh, EDA 101. But let me first introduce myself. Uh, my name is Trent Thompson. I'm the economic development representative from, uh, from the Economic Development Administration out of the US Department of Commerce. That's a mouthful, but I'm, I'm the Colorado Economic Development Representative. So what that means is I work with communities throughout the state, um, a hand in hand with those communities as they're developing their economic development projects and priorities. And then, and then if it's right to apply for EDA, I help them through that process. So, um, and I'm gonna get into that, that a little bit with, with communities with, even within the Dr. Cog region, um, even though you currently don't have an economic development district, but, but I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Um, real briefly, uh, EDA, um, it, I'm moving on to the next slide, just to give you, a, a, to, for folks that may not be completely familiar with EDA, the biggest kind of thing to think about us is we're a grant agency. So we're a grant agency, we use your tax dollars, but we give them back to you to implement your economic development priorities. Um, and we're really focused on local economic development priorities. Uh, and, and so projects are locally driven. Um, they also have to have a high correlation to quality job creation. That's kind of the big thing uh, with EDA is that uh, whether, whether it's myopic or not, um, one of the things that we focus strongly on is how does our partnership with the community have a direct correlation to quality job creation. And we can talk about what that means and how, how that is at any time, but, um, but that's, that's the gist of EDA is we're a grant, a grant agency. We have one institutional grant program and that one institutional grant program is called the Partnership Planning Grant. It is uh, a grant that is, uh, allows for uh, regions multiple counties um, to come together and usually in a council of governments like Dr. Cog. So it's, it's, not, it's not recreating the wheel, but to, to develop uh, regional plans, as, as Flo mentioned, comprehensive economic development strategies um, for their region. Um, and it's utilizing federal access to federal resources. I'm fully aware, because I was looking through Metro Vision uh, just this week, that uh, Dr. Cog already has the resources, already has the capability, already has the economists on staff and, and is doing economic development planning in the region. Uh, the reason why I think it's opportunity, and there's a number of reasons why it's, a, it's, it's an opportune time to talk about becoming an economic development district um, is because you'd just be leveraging your, the resources you're already using for planning so that you can gain access to additional federal funds uh, primarily. Um, and so let me move to the second to last slide, because this is the one I'm going to stick on most. It's just a, a map, and it's just so you can see where there are existing economic development districts. And then the gray area, obviously, is Dr. Cog. And then the white areas are areas that are, and, and, and Greg is working with these communities as well, um, considering becoming districts as well. Um, you have Parker, Teller, and El Paso in the south, Larimer and Weld in the north, and then the Northeast Council uh, Association of Local Governments uh, in the Northeast. They're all also considering becoming a district. Um, and there's a reason why everyone's considering it right now. Um, let me get into uh, EDA though a little bit. When we talk about what EDA can do, we can do everything from planning to helping communities in, in planning or feasibility studies, 
to helping them execute operational projects. So think a business incubator, a workforce development program, a revolving loan fund program. We can help with operational support on setting up those projects. And then we can also do public works infrastructure um, and, and construction projects. So along that whole spectrum of capability we can do. And the partnership planning obviously is focusing on capacity building and on planning component. What an economic development district does for a community is it, it beyond the fact that it's allowing for this planning process and development of a SEDS, it's also gaining access to the ZDA programs that allow that can provide grants to, to communities. Um, that access, it's it's almost a it's a it's a requirement that any community that applies for an EDA grant has an active SEDS. Um, and, and right now, Dr. Cog does not have an active SEDS. Uh, but I am working with multiple communities in your region right now. And there's in, in just in our regional office, our regional office manages grants, and then our national office also has grant programs. Just in our regional office alone, there's $5.25 million of grants uh, that uh, are in, in the pipeline. They're not public yet because they haven't been awarded, but there are communities, there are places of higher education, there are community organizations, there are economic development organizations, and there are uh, entrepreneurship organizations and workforce development nonprofits all in the Denver region right now that are th going through this process of an application with us. And they're all, as I say, on a glide path to an award because they've already been through the merit review and they're on that glide path. So uh, roughly $5 million of funding. And the reason we can do that, the reason why EDA right now is working with communities in your region, even though you don't have an active sense, is because I'm, I'm giving credit where credit's due, OEDIT had the foresight during the pandemic to realize that a third of the state didn't have a district. Um, and that 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 they in order to, to band-aid and to to allow for us to do that, we put together uh, well, we worked with OEDIT and OEDIT put together uh, SEDS equivalents. Um, and, and they're not going to last forever, but they are planning documents that allow us to check that box so that we can work with communities. Because EDA at the end of the day wanted to make sure we can work with communities during this heightened uh, disaster that, 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 that struck the whole nation. So, and those, those $5 million of projects is just the tip of the iceberg. We're, there are national programs. There's the Build Back Better Regional Challenge that um, a number of communities, a number of organizations in the Denver region are part of the Colorado Coalition to apply for that billion dollar competition, as well as um, the Good Jobs Challenge, which is a workforce focused uh, national competition and our annual um, entrepreneurship and, and uh, support to entrepreneurs program called Build to Scale that a number of communities throughout the Denver region have applied in the past and will continue to apply. So just know that that's how EDA is involved in, in your region right now. Um, and so that speaks, I think, to the need. Um, and it also speaks to, to, to the need because of the pandemic. And that's why it's also the right, I think, the right time if Dr. Cog was ever to, to become a district this is a, a, a good timing for it. One, because of what Greg's gonna talk about when he talks through the, 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 the non-competitive grant that they have, uh, they're have they working with to be able to do the statewide SEDS and to help communities in, in developing the SEDS. So there's federal funds available to become a district right now. But more importantly, EDA typically um, manages or, or allows for projects um, based on eligibility and allows for districts based on eligibility. And eligibility, typically is based on distress as it's compared to unemployment and or per capita income. Right now, the, the Dr. Cog has one county that has higher unemployment than the national average. And that may change, obviously, and it will likely change up and down throughout the throughout this country. Um, but that's, that's uh, the rest of the counties wouldn't be eligible. But for the fact that we are in a national pandemic. We have a national federally declared disaster that has allowed every county in the nation to be eligible to apply for economic development district um, uh, at this time. The only challenge is, is that the longer you wait, if you decide maybe not this year, maybe next year, it's more difficult to use that as an eligibility. Um, a disaster technically lasts till the end of time when it comes to um, working with federal grants. The challenge is being able to link the economic damages that resulted from that said disaster when you're applying for, for a grant. And right now, 
every county in the country can say, can talk about economic damages that happened because of the pandemic. So that's why, it, especially now, I think the timing is, 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 is right. Um, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there because I don't wanna steal any more of Greg's thunder, but I also wanna make sure that if there are questions or if there are any, um, any, anything that I can do to help answer the process and um, how uh, EDA would be involved um, you know, going forward with a district ship, I would be the point, main point of contact with Dr. Cog and I would be able to help them through that process along with working hand in hand with Greg. Great, thank you. I think I would like to uh, hear from OEdit uh, first and then take uh, questions at the end so we can have a comprehensive view uh, before asking questions. So who's up? Yeah, very good. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Greg Thomason. I am the Eastern Plains Rural Opportunity Representative for the Office of Economic Development and International Trade. And uh, give me just one second to upload my presentation and I will share with you what we have to offer. So uh, as Trent has already indicated, um, the Office of Economic Development is going to uh, communities, uh, regions that do not have active comprehensive economic development strategies with a special program that uh, we believe uh, can help incentivize uh, those regions to uh, look at developing that comprehensive economic development strategy. And uh, just to make uh, a point of clarification, we're simultaneously also pursuing a statewide comprehensive economic development strategy. Uh, we're very fortunate to be one of five uh, states to uh, receive a, a non-compete uh, grant from the Economic Development Administration that allows us to not only uh, offer uh, regions that don't have uh, comprehensive economic development strategies and incentive to uh, move forward in developing those, but also uh, the opportunity has arisen for us to create a statewide uh, comprehensive economic development strategy. And again, tonight I'll just focus on the regional sense since uh, that is uh, the issue that Dr. Cog will want to uh, consider further and uh, take a vote on, I hope. So tonight, uh, I plan to uh, provide you an overview of the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy Program. Uh, I will then cover the three-step process uh, for uh, implementing a SEDS. We'll then talk about the value proposition behind having a SEDS, and then also the cost estimate for managing your SEDS. And then uh, finally, the uh, assistance grant that the Office of Economic Development International Trade is offering to those regions, again, that don't have uh, comprehensive economic development strategies. This uh, comprehensive economic development strategy program traces its origins back to the Public Works and Economic Development Act of 1965, which authorized the creation of the Economic Development Administration. In establishing the EDA, Congress articulated three tenets that remain a part of the SEDS program. The first, creating an environment that promotes economic activity by improving and expanding public infrastructure. Next, promoting job creation through increased innovation, productivity, and entrepreneurship. And finally, empowering local and regional communities experiencing chronic high unemployment and low per capita income to develop private sector businesses and attract increased private sector capital investments. Regions have the opportunity to undertake the development of the uh, SEDS on their own or hire a consultant, preferably one with experience in adhering to EDA guidelines to create a SEDS. Upon completion, the SEDS document will be reviewed by the Economic Development Administration to ensure that it meets the EDA standards, which will include designating the agency that will oversee, the admin, oversee and administer uh, this uh, plan. Plans are required to be managed uh, by a planning organization, typically an economic development district. 
In Colorado, EDDs typically reside within regional associations and coalitions of government. Establishing an EDD is altogether a separate process that does not begin until after the region has authorized, uh, has an authorized sets in place. Oops. Uh, Greg, this is uh, Chair Flynn. I had a question on in the chat. Is there a way to make the screen uh, uh, larger, your slide larger? Oh, I don't see any option okay. on my uh, controls here. Okay, uh, Melinda no. just put a link. If some, if people want to follow along on an, on their browser, there's a link in the chat. Uh, I have it up as a PDF on my screen, uh, but I did see the note from uh, Director Condo of North Glen on okay. in the uh, in the chat. Uh, director, you could go to the link that's in the chat if you want to uh, go full screen. Thank you. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, no, and I apologize that the, the uh, visibility is so poor. Um, and uh, Not a problem. Go ahead. Okay. And I'm trying to get my, there we go. Okay. Comprehensive economic development strategies reflect a region's commitment to the adherence of capacity building plans designed to foster regional economic prosperity. Regions that have established active SEDs are eligible to receive a $70,000 annual economic planning grant. This is a matching grant program with the match determined by a formula that measures a region's economic stress. What does this get you? In good times, regions with active SEDs cite the benefits of the program to include bringing communities closer together, creating a shared vision where a region uh, can determine or express their goals and objectives, and then making a region more competitive. During times of disaster or economic hardship, the SEDs becomes a qualifier for making application to the EDA for funding relief. A majority of the grants offered by the EDA, HUD, as well as the USDA now require proof that an overriding economic development strategy is in place. In other words, a SEDS. In the absence of having a SEDS, the EDA will require proof of a SEDS-like document that can be somewhat onerous to uh, create in times of disaster or need. The EDA and USDA support four assistance categories around which they align their grant funding programs. These include planning and technical assistance, infrastructure and broadband assistance, entrepreneurship and business assistance, as well as workforce development and livability. As represented by this slide, the list of programs that communities can leverage under each of these categories is substantial. At a minimum, the cost to Dr. Cog for maintaining this SEDS program is a one-to-one -one match or $70,000, which leverages an additional $70,000 for the region to provide Dr. Cog and ultimately the Economic Development District with an operating budget of $140,000. Remember, establishing an economic development district to manage your regional sets is a non-negotiable requirement. With this as the operating budget, you're able to pay salaries and expenses associated with managing this program. For several regions, these funds are able to support hiring an economic development planner, plus a part-time administrator to manage bookkeeping and reporting requirements. The overriding priority is to ensure that the SED serves your region, providing a master plan that is used in good times to set goals and objectives and aid in attracting new businesses to the region. And when disaster hits, 
the SEDS establishes authorization to move forward with applying for the needed federal funds to help with, rec uh, with recovery efforts. The final point that I'd like to uh, cover with you uh, today regards the Office of Economic Development and International Trades offer to provide Dr. Cog with a $40,000 grant to assist with the cost of completing your SEDS application. This is a, um, uh, a non-match grant. So if Dr. Cog was able to uh, have a SEDS written for $40,000, uh, there would be no cost uh, associated to your organization for completing that SEDS. Uh, the Office of Economic Development would cover the full price of that SEDS. If it goes over that $40,000 uh, uh, grant amount, then of course there would be additional funds that uh, Dr. Cog would need to uh, bring to uh, the project. As I noted earlier, there are uh, regional regions that have undertaken this process of gathering input for their SEDS and then written their own documents and submitted them to the Economic Development Administration. If you were to elect to do this, OEDIT's $40,000 grant could be applied to cover any incidental costs uh, that might happen or, or, or come up uh, during that uh, self, uh, self uh, generating uh, process. Or you could apply the $40,000 uh, to a project uh, that was identified in your SEDS once you were uh, completed with having that SEDS authorized. And at that point, I'll just see if there are any questions. Thank you, uh, uh, and to uh, Trent also. Uh, let me ask uh, members uh, for their questions. Okay, first I see uh, Director Spear, go ahead. Thank you, and thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I just had a couple of questions about this. Um, one, I was wondering about the um, $70,000 a year uh, match and kind of the, the cost that you mentioned. Is that an ongoing um, annual kind of thing? Is it just a one-time thing? I'm assuming it's ongoing, but I just wanted to. It is. It's our only institutional grant. Every normal grants for EDA are, are to help start up something or to expand an existing program for a one to three year period. But the economic development districts are intended to be institutional. So it's $70,000. And it's $70,000 right now. If we get reauthorized, NATO, the National Association of Development Organizations, is advocating for $250,000 uh, to every district and a 90-10 split in match. So, mm -hmm. but that's that's a big if. So that's a very big if. Right now, what Congress is, is allocating is 70,000 to every district. And the match may change based on the distress levels of that region. But it's, it is institutional. It's okay. annual. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Director Coombs, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. So my question is in relation to kind of existing economic development councils that we have in our cities and counties, um, what, if any, relationship would they have um, to Dr. Cog as an economic development entity? So the, uh, when, it, when it comes to the relationship with the district or with Dr. Cog, I guess, are you asking? Um, yeah, so with the district, sorry, through yep. Dr. Cog. No, so it's a good question. Um, the, 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 the decision on the composition of the economic development district board is up to the community when they're applying. Many times, um, there are some uh, requirements within EDA to ensure that you have members of, of economic development community members, you have maybe places of higher education involved, but many times they overlap consistently with the council of government itself. And so they may have one board meeting like this one now, and then following this, they may add a few new members um, depending on how you decide as, as, your, as Dr. Cog decides, the Economic Development District Board, and then that meeting would happen you know, thereafter. So what EDA is trying to be very flexible when, when districts are created, that they are able to fit into the existing infrastructure of, of the community that's applying for it. And then the community gets to decide, how is the board gonna be structured? Who's going to be part of that board? Does that answer your question? 
Um, somewhat. So I guess I just wonder, other than being on the board, are there other ways that these entities might have a relationship with the district? Is there going to be collaboration? Is that something we kind of determine in terms of looking at what our kind of assets may be in the region? 100%. So when it comes to applying for an EDA project, you can work directly with me and I would work with the economic development district to make sure they're aware and you're all working together because many times the economic development district is going to know more about your project or more about EDA as well um, to be able to give you guidance and, and assistance. So um, it's it, there. there's so so the relationship is dependent on how the community wants to define the board a that's internally to the district and then in how you're communicating with eda i'm i'm available to every public entity and every nonprofit that's in colorado if you are an eligible applicant you can contact me any day of the week and i will set up a meeting with you to talk through your project all right thank you thank you uh before i go to director levy i think uh Executive Director Rex needed to uh, uh, get in on this and clarify or add to. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Uh, yeah, I did want to just clarify a little bit with regards. So I was in Oklahoma City when they stood up their, their economic development district. So I have a little bit of knowledge. I wasn't necessarily, I was on the transportation <laughs> side. So I, I sat in on meetings. So, um, but one thing I do know, and to answer your question, uh, uh, Director Coombs, to the best I understood it, was that um, like local local economic development groups or or councils or whatever, they were actively involved in the development of the SEDs as well as the ongoing um, relationship with the EDD. So we have already reached out to um, um, Metro Denver ED, EDC and we're going to have uh, some conversations with them as well as the Metro Chamber and we will begin to 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 kind of advance out from that point just to make sure that everybody understands you know what we're trying to, to accomplish uh, with the possibility of this designation we don't want to get into anybody else's anybody's business with regards to this we just think there's value in the coordination of some uh, economic development and i know that's the purpose and goal of establishing the edd thank you sir excellent thank you uh, director levy you have the floor thank you mr chair so I was wondering, there's the slide, the third slide on the three tenets um, for uh, these economic development um, districts of promoting economic activity, promoting job creation, empowering local and regional communities. Um, how, given all our work on um, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, reduce you know all, all the transportation side of things which which in which we're really trying to work towards reducing uh, emissions and improving air quality and mobility and all of those things are there um, I guess I'm not sure how to ask this artfully um, would those would would could we require ourselves, our own economic development district to be consistent or not do anything inconsistent with those goals? Or does it function, would that district, even though there may be overlapping board membership, would that district function very independently of Dr. Cog? I think what I'm, what I'm wondering about is there a potential that we would have two entities that might be working at cross purposes with one another. Yeah. I can I can respond, but I may not be the right person to respond. You 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 decide how the board would would want to work. So Dr. Cog is in control of the board and deciding whose membership, as long as it fits within the broad guidelines of, of economic development. And there's some broad guidelines that I can I can share with folks down the road or, or hereafter. But ideally, the whole point of a regional comprehensive economic development strategy is exactly, I think, as you're relaying, it's what the region's priorities are. What are the uh, goals for the region and, and, and when it comes to economic development and how, that, if, and how that relates to other priorities, you decide. It's your, you, are, you are doing the plan completely. And then you, we're just kind of saying, yep, you check the box that you, you had a SWOT analysis, a st strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Yes, you have a, a resiliency section, which I know Metro Vision already has. Um, you, yes, you have a list of, of priority projects that the region has said, these are the projects that we think are important. 
those are that's how EDA gets involved. Other than that, it's 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 definitely Dr. Cog and the community that's 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 driving it. Thank you. Thank you. Is that it? Thank you, uh, Director Starker. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, what would be the impact on the resources, uh, particularly the the personnel resources, Cog to bring this program on? So the only hard requirement that EDA has is that you 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 are you do have someone who is the planning coordinator on staff, and that's what the seventy thousand dollars per year is 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 intended for. Um, that per, that staff can also utilize do other things as if they're being paid through other funds as well. But the primary requirement, other than having the 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 the, the well drafting every five years this comprehensive economic development strategy, and then uh, updating it annually up until that five-year rewrite and then that someone is in charge of doing that and that's the usually it's a it's a it's an edd director uh laura lewis marchino is the edd director for region nine in the north southwest part of the state um is an example um but they may be doing many other things as well as this planning coordination coordination effort um so that would be that's the that's the prime use of the funds at least or, or leveraging of them Okay. And Doug, do you, do we have personnel, uh, this would fit into our personnel profile and, and uh, workload sort of going on? Yeah. Um, Director Starker, thank you for the question. I, I would suggest that we would probably hire an additional person to, to fulfill this role. Um, the 70,000, as you know, can only stretch so far. I have talked to uh, uh, colleagues around the country that are our EDDs. And um, they've actually um, either funded that with, uh, with general fund monies or have actually uh, partnered with um, area chambers or you know, kind of scrapped together some money, scotch tape money together to get a coordinator in place. And because I think ultimately the economic <laughs> development professionals see value in, in the regional coordination. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't know you could scotch tape money together. Very interesting. Uh, Director Harrison, go ahead. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the presentation for both of, both of them. Um, it's a wealth of information. It's uh, an assistance that I think, obviously, Denver is growing as it is, uh, and the Denver metro area, including the state, can really help. Um, my concern, obviously, from a coordination standpoint, is with so many cooks in the kitchen, how do we really coordinate that effort in a way that not only stands, us, stands the program up, to, to start to be successful, but to the point of carrying it on through its, through its lifespan so that we can see the tangible benefits and for the folks on the ground that really impacts them. Um, and so that we can see those benefits for them in, in terms of their economies growing where they typically haven't. Um, how do we work on that? What's the focus that we should, we should do from a best practices perspective, having done this other places? Uh, director, uh, Executive Director Rex, do you want to address that? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, sure. and and uh, Director Harrison, thank you, sir, for the question. I, I will I will say that uh, I think as far as the next step for you all, it might be good if we brought in one of our counterparts from across the country to basically to address that in in a very factual matter, as opposed to me anecdotally providing some information that may or may not be true. Um, <laughs> And I, I have a couple communities in, in mind across the country that I think one that's going through the process now of developing the SEDs, and it is a long process it's, and, and getting that, that, that designation, it does take some time, um, as well as someone that has been, you know, as a pretty mature EDD. Um, so I, if, it's, if it pleases the board, I'll, I'll schedule those for a board work session in the coming months and, uh, and we can get some additional info. What um uh, Doug, has it taken to set that up at, at UFC? Yeah, that might be a question for Trent. I, I will tell you that I know there are some, you know, there is, you know, a little bit of a backlog right now. And I know some of our, you know, in kind of the 18 months, the two years before they've gotten the approval of their sets. You're right. You're right, Doug. Um, it, you're, what's going to happen, what would happen is you would officially apply for, well, you could apply, you don't have to, you could just draft your SEDs if you wanted to, 
and then say, hey, it, this is our active SEDS, is it qualified? We would review it and say, yep, it is. And then you would apply for what's called partnership planning grant. Once you, that, that could take uh, up uh, 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 at least six months likely. And then what we have to do is make sure you're then on the list that Congress approves every year when they approve the budget. So that will take some time before the funds actually start flowing. You may be designated a district let's say in December, but you may not start seeing funding until the spring because, because it was a continuing resolution or the budget hasn't passed. So it could be a year to two years before the district is fully funded and, and operating. Yeah, and, and, and that's helpful. I mean, obviously long-term, we, so we, we do short focus on short-term, but obviously with the economy slowing down dramatically, interest rates being double what they were just five months ago, that the, the cost of, borrowing money, for instance, for those companies or those startups or anybody that it's, it's prohibitively more expensive. So within the programs that there are, are there any that are more agile that can get on the ground, at least be a Band-Aid or something that can help get them through this phase? Because in the next six months, it's not going to be pretty for a lot of those folks. So is there anything we can do? Yeah, so the, 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 the partnership planning grant is meant to be a long term, let's make this an institution. So, so it shouldn't be considered the saving grace to when, when there's a downturn in the economy. We're working with communities right now from the pandemic and the 5.25 million, those, those projects, they're going to be focusing on developing a smart city business incubator. They're focusing on workforce development in, um, in, in, in underserved areas. It's focusing on um, working in, I'll, I'll give one away, working with Mount, Be Mount, Mount Bello and helping them develop uh, and support their small businesses. Um, so, so we're doing that already now, but the only reason we can do that is because OEDIT worked with us to get that Band-Aid, that, that SEDS equivalent document that we're using as the check the box. Um, but that isn't gonna last forever. How, the other thing to note though, specifically to your question about getting funds to businesses, I know, um, the OED had also worked with B-Sides, Region 9, and the Colorado Entrepreneurs Fund, Entrepreneurship Fund, and there's a statewide revolving loan fund program that uh, is, is, is funded with EDA, uh, initially with EDA funds, and obviously it's just one part of an ecosystem of revolving loan funds from the, from the, for the state, but that's available today. Um, that's available to businesses today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Director Spear. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify my understanding. So it sounds like we, we would get a lot of um, kind of financial support, match support, um, $70,000 a year uh, in order to do this, that um, it would be a newer position, right? So it wouldn't take a lot of um, time from kind of existing staff. Um, and there's a $40,000 startup um, grant non-match that's available, right, to help out with costs too. So it seems like all around there's a lot of financial resources and um, to provide the staff to kind of help out with this. So I have two questions um, and this, this may be um, Executive Director Rex for the uh, conversation with somebody from one of these groups um, that's involved in this. Uh, which is what? What's the time requirement from the um, boards of directors? I mean, are you know, is that sort of another um, plan to review and you know work on and talk about every year, um, and or every five years? And then um, my other question is that I I imagine there may be some groups and places that have decided not to move forward with this, and I'm just curious why what what their thinking was around that and that. That may be a question for a later conversation as well, um, but just two things that would be helpful for me. Thank you. Uh, Doug, do you want to respond? Well, I, I saw Trent click off, clicked off his, uh, or clicked on his mic, so maybe he should. <laughs> I will just say that you can look at a map of all the country, of the entire country to see which one, what parts of the country don't have uh, districts. There, I, I would guess 85% of the country is, is covered. Um, and then I, I will, I will ask Greg if he wants to talk about Northeast Colorado Association of Local Governments because they did have an active SEDS in 2017 and they decided against becoming a district. I think that was because of financial inability to provide to, to even get the match, but I don't know the I don't know the answer. And I'll just stop there. Thank um, you, Greg. Go ahead. Yeah, happy to uh, respond to that. And you're correct, uh, Trent. In 2012, Northeast Colorado Association of Local Governments 
adopted or submitted a SEDS application that was uh, authorized by the EDA. In 2017, uh, and actually that was a provisional SEDS. So they went only halfway in setting up their uh, full economic uh, development planning process by, because they elected to not establish an economic development district to manage their SEDS. So in that instance, NACALC actually took on the fiduciary role and became the manager of the SEDS. And without that uh, planning uh, director uh, helping the counties coordinate and utilize the comprehensive economic development strategy, it essentially sat on the shelves of six EDO organizations or economic development organizations, that would not be redundant. Uh, and so when it came time to renew the SEDS in 2017, except for one application uh, for uh, flood uh, grant or flood relief uh, that was submitted in 2013, uh, the directors at NACALC said, you know, it really didn't benefit us. Uh, we're not going to, uh, uh, you know, support this financially. They're now very uh, engaged in conversations with me, as are the other three districts, uh, including Dr. Cog, uh, that don't have uh, active uh, comprehensive economic development strategies in looking at setting up economic development strategies. I dare say that you know, we could, at the end of this process, actually have a state that had uh, all 14 regions covered uh, by comprehensive economic development strategies. And if I may, I'd like to just add one other point that I've, I've made to the other uh, communities that I've spoken to. And that is, while the SED sits under an economic development uh, district uh, and can be utilized for regional programs, it can also be referenced by individual communities and counties when they're pursuing grants through the USDA, HUD, or uh, EDA. And so it really becomes a very uh, versatile uh, uh, plan to have in place. And I think, you know, Trent has already alluded, if you can check that box that says, yes, we do have an active says, whether you're a small community, a county, or a regional organization, it really does carry a lot more weight uh, and help that application process move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Director? Thank you. Yes. Uh, up next is uh, Director Levy. Go ahead. Yeah, thank, thank you. And, and so, and I appreciate it, Director Spears' question. Um, I, I guess I'm wondering for an area such as the area encompassed by Dr. Cog that's actually experiencing a lot of growth, um, a lot of economic development activity right now with a lot of new businesses moving in. Um, are there, what sorts of benefits would, um, would a region like ours be getting out of yet another economic development entity? And Trent, if I may, I'd like to maybe just uh, answer that first. <clears throat> it really becomes a vision document. And so it's not just a document that serves you in economic uh, periods of economic downturn. Uh, I, I believe, you know, or, or let's just take transportation. You know, transportation could be part of that visioning that you bring into the SEDS. And it could be, you know, we want to be, you know, 100% uh, clean transportation by 20, 2030, 2035, whatever the date uh, line is that you might have in mind. And so then as, as grant opportunities come through EDA, there could well be a grant that, you know, is focused on either uh, smart transportation or clean transportation initiatives and you can point to that as already being in your comprehensive economic development strategy and thereby elevate your qualifications for receiving that grant. So it, it becomes, again, that visioning doc, document that, uh, you know, serves a multitude of uh, purposes, only bound by, you know, what your goals and aspirations are. Thank you. 
Mr. Chairman, if I could, please. Oh, sure. Go ahead, Flo. Um, it's a great question, Director Levy, but you have to understand that the, the, the growth um, and the prosperity that we're seeing in the Denver, in, in, in the Dr. Cog region um, is a little spotty. And, and for our smaller communities, the communities like Lyons or Mead or Idaho Springs or Bennett or Lockbury or Larkspur um, don't have quite the same capacities that a Denver or a Boulder has. And, and so a SEDS and an economic development district would be a boon to some of our smaller, more rural, more remote communities as well. Thank you. Um, any other questions, comments? Uh, if not, let me ask Doug and maybe Flo, uh, what do you see as our next steps? And I heard you say that you want to bring this back for a, a work uh, uh, to a work session. I also heard some members express an interest in hearing not only from other uh, regions that have uh, gone this route, but some that have uh, explored it and, and decided not to, uh, Northeast Colorado being one, but there might be others that are more comparable uh, to us. Uh, could I'd ask you to search for examples on uh, all around the, the the horn on this and, and come back to us at a work session uh, sometime in a month, in a few months, certainly not next month, but uh, yeah. down the road. Uh, no, what, would be, what would be your intention? Anything differently from that? No, um, I, yeah, I, I think, you know, at this point, I think it'd be great if we could get some practical examples of how, how this has been applied in other regions. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, maybe I can talk to Trent and or Greg um, about, you know, other areas that began to explore or even did a says and then didn't ultimately um, do it. So we, you know, we'll, we'll have those conversations. We'll try to find something for you. Excellent. Uh, are there any other questions or comments from folks before we close this out? I don't see any. Uh, so let me actually, let me thank Trent and Greg for being here and for being so open about this and then handling these questions and, and perhaps uh, have them back when we do the work session and when we have some practical uh, presentations from other regions. All right, uh, seeing no other questions on this, let me flip over to my agenda and uh, see what we have next. Report of the chair is next. Uh, my report is that we're gonna move on with the meeting now. Uh, I don't have anything else to report. Uh, performance and engagement uh, committee is first. Uh, when are you here? Performance and engagement. I don't see. If she's unavailable, unavailable, Mr. Chairman, I'm I for sure can uh, provide a quick okay. report. Apparently, so, she's out performing and engaging. Yeah. Uh, go, go ahead. <laughs> so, um, performance and engagement committee met at five o'clock this evening, um, and. Um, they had two agenda items on there. One was a debrief on the on the board on the board uh, uh, award celebration, um, and we had a great conversation there. A lot of good feedback from the board um, that we'll take into account and make our next one even better than than this one was. And the uh, the second item was a discussion about the uh, collaboration assessment survey. So every year for new board members. Um, we roll out a survey to the board, the performance and engagement committee does, and just asks about your experience serving on the board and, uh, and has, you know, there's basically, there's like 10 different areas or elements that we explore. And um, so ultimately what we're trying to accomplish with that survey is to make this collaborative the best it can be. So we take the, the performance and engagement committee takes that survey very seriously and, uh, and hopefully uh, through through that we can again improve our collaboration. So that was that's what we talked about today. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Director Rex. So next up we have a report from uh, Finance and Budget Committee, and Director Mulvey is going to give that report. Go ahead. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I chaired in the excused absence of Jeff Baker, Treasurer, who chairs the Finance and Budget Committee. The items uh, for action related to the Area Agency on Aging 
And the item of most interest was the NIMBY science for mobile fall prevention. There was is a mobile app that was funded. It was a pilot program last year and it helps people with fall protection and it's available to anyone who lives in the metro area. They can um, access that on their app and their phone and their mobile device and it is free then for those over 60. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Mulvey. Uh, next on the agenda is a report from Executive Director Rex. Uh, Doug, you have the floor. Thank you, sir, very much. And I'll be quick. I know we got a long agenda here. Uh, again, good, good evening, everybody. And unfortunately, we can't be uh, in person tonight, um, but hopefully hopefully we can we can accomplish that next next month. I was just came back from the National Association of Regional Councils uh, conference in uh, Columbus. I was there for a couple of days and talking to our my East Coast colleagues. They said their their caseload infection cases are, are on the downslope now. So hopefully that gets out this way by, by next month. So we certainly anticipate uh, meeting in person next next month. Uh, Bike to Work Day uh, is exactly one week away. It's on Jan June uh, 22nd. And uh, our Way to Go team is working with partners across the region to organize literally hundreds of breakfast and breakfast stations and um, uh, bike home stations. Um, and this, this year, we're, you know, kind of back to somewhat of a normal schedule for our Bike to Work Day, um, it's the return of the business challenge too. So organizations like yours jurisdictions are eligible to participate and we certainly invite you to do so. If you were to go to um, uh, biketoworkday.co, uh, you can pledge there uh, just to ride individually or sign up for, for the business challenge. Um, the, the grand prize this year for, for your pledge to ride is a custom e-bike from a Denver manu manufacturer, Fatty Bikes, valued at around $3,000. So it's a pretty cool deal. And we certainly appreciate the, their, their sponsorship. Um, for those who ordered shirts and or hats, uh, they're coming, but there's a chance they won't be here uh, in time to be shipped until Monday. I know it's not great, but we're trying to try to get it out to you. We might even we might even be able to hand deliver a few few of those in the in, in the outskirts. So um, we'll let you know, but we certainly like to make sure you get those by in time for for Wednesday. So if you have any questions, just reach out to myself or Steve Erickson, our communications director. We'll be happy to happy to uh, uh, get you going in the right right direction. Um, at this time, Mr. Chairman, I would like to uh, just recognize a new member of the Dr. Cog senior management team. Um, we, I would like to introduce to you uh, our new regional planning and development uh, division director, Sheila Lynch. And I don't know if Sheila's on the call. I believe she is. I don't know if she wanted to flash on her camera real quick and say hi. Um, if you recall, this is, this is the, 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 the position that was formerly held by Brad Calvert before he headed up in the mountains uh, to Steamboat Springs. Um, and just so you all know, so I mean, among the other tasks that she will have, she's responsible for leading the development and implementation of Dr. Cog Metro Vision Plan. So we're really excited to have her. She comes with a wealth of knowledge in the planning field. Um, she, she comes to us directly from Tri-County Health Department where she served as, as the Land Use and Built Environment Manager. And prior to her time there at Tri-County, Tri she, she, uh, uh, she was an associate planner at Lakewood for six years. And then she had a stint in, um, in, the, in the Twin Cities area where she served uh, a couple different uh, uh, roles there. Um, one with the Capitol River Council as a neighborhood coordinator. So we're so excited to have her on board. Um, hopefully next month when we meet in person, you'll get a chance to meet her. I think you'll be You'll be we'll, you'll be impressed, and I think uh, uh, again we're just excited to have her, Mr. Chairman. One other thing before we go. Uh, oh, another it's Jayla's birthday, so I had to be sure to mention that Jayla's twenty nine today, right? Jayla's that's what you told me. I'm pretty sure. I hope she's on the line. Anyway, I am. I am. Yeah, he didn't give you so the, much. He didn't <laughs> give you the day off. For your birthday he did not I, we he go. said Horrible. you want to share it with your second family your birthday with your second family and that's the board of directors of dr first, first i've heard that so first happy to that. share it with you all <laughs> happy birthday jayla and <laughs> thank you we, we, we send you a virtual birthday greeting uh, <laughs> we were gonna have we were gonna have um cupcakes but we didn't meet in person so darn it 
<laughs> okay, we'll bring them next. Bring them next month. We'll microwave okay. them if they're stale. All right. Thank you. That's it, Mr. Done? Chairman. Go, go okay. abs. I have I have one request though uh, regarding bike to work day. Would staff be able to uh, get statistics uh, participation stats from the last uh, normal year, 2019, number of participants, and compare it to what we have this year? Because work uh, bike to work day. A lot of people, for a lot of people, that would mean taking the bike out of the backyard and putting it in the garage because they're working from home. Right. But there's been such a shift. Yeah, I know Dr. our own internal staff. I know that city, city of Denver staff, so many of them are working from home. So I'm wondering how much that might cut into uh, participation. I, I've heard some pretty extraordinary levels of, of uh, staff working from home. So uh, if we could get a statistic on that afterward, that'd be fabulous. Uh, Director Stolzman, uh, you want to uh, comment on this also? I just was going to say on that topic, um, at, at least out here in the suburbs um, for Bike to Work Day last year, we saw tremendous participation, like more than usual, because people who were working from home took the opportunity to bike to all of our local stations. So they would go from station uh, to station. So we actually had a okay. great turnout because of it. Excellent. Okay. Very good. Uh, Director Wheelock, go ahead. Yeah, on the same subject also, I'd like to say that we can almost consider it bike for work or bike to work or bike, bike in support of work. I know that often during our dur during this COVID thing, we've found that we have, I mean, I have found, and I've heard this observation kind of universally, I'm not sure we're working less by being able to work efficiently from home. I think we just find more ways to attend meetings for about 16 hours a day. And I know that personally myself, I find going out and getting on my bike for that 45 minute break in between and uh, like climbing a few hundred feet or something like that out of my house where I live uh, is uh, keeps me alive as I get through all this additional work. And I, I think that a lot of the people here can can identify with that additional work and the idea that getting out and getting a little fresh air and using your bike to stay alive while you're trying to survive this is a um, is a good thing. Interesting. Maybe we could look at rebranding it. Uh, you know, some somehow. I, I could uh, I could bike off a few pandemic pounds, perhaps. Uh, that might work for me. Uh, with, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Director Rex. The next item on the agenda is public comment, and if there are members of the public who wish to comment, uh, I would like to invite them to raise their virtual hand. And I know that the because we had the presentations at the the uh, EDA presentations at the beginning, uh, we kind of had people waiting. So I apologize to any member of the public who has been waiting to offer their three minutes of public comment. I don't see any hands raised. Uh, Melinda, has anyone uh, indicated prior to the meeting that uh, they would uh, offer public comment? Uh, no, they have not. Okay, I know my friend Randall Loeb uh, tries to come here every month, and he was at Denver City Council as well. I don't see him. Uh, so we'll move on uh, without any public comment. Uh, next is uh, item is to approve the consent agenda for tonight. The consent agenda consists, I believe, only, uh, when I looked at it, it, was only the minutes from last month's meeting. Uh, so let me solicit, uh, please raise your hand uh, if you want to make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Uh, Director Shaw. Director Shaw is moving the. Uh, can you speak now? Yes, I hope so. Can you hear so, me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, good. Yay. Um, I move to approve the consent agenda. Thank you. Director Harrison. I second. Thank you. Uh, no dis is there any discussion on the consent agenda? And the Lord, again, I hope not. Uh, all right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Wow, that was all in harmony. I love that. Any opposed? <laughs> okay. Any abstentions? Seeing none, the consent agenda is approved. Now uh, we move on to our action items. And we're, we're just about, we're a little nine minutes over the time stamp here. So I think we're, we're making up for some time. Uh, uh, we have Alvin uh, Bedal Sanchez, discussion of federal performance targets. Uh, Alvin, are you ready to take over? I am, Chair. Thank you. Give me a second to share my screen and we'll get started.
All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, as introduced, Alvin Bilal Sanchez, transportation planner here with Dr. Cog. Uh, pronouns are he, him, and his. And the item before you today for action relates to our federal performance areas. There are five of those that Dr. Cog is subject to through our federal legislation. Uh, the one we're discussing today is the most expansive of them, PM3, also known as System Performance Freight and CMAC. Uh, for each of the five, we either report to the Federal Highway Administration or the Federal Transit Administration, and each comes with their own reporting requirements, um, data that's used, uh, expectations on adoption by Dr. Cog, and I'll run through the most applicable parts this evening. Um, I mentioned it's the most expansive performance area. We're actually only touching two of those today, traffic congestion reduction, which looks at annual hours of peak hour excessive delay and the percent of non-single occupancy vehicle travel. And the second one is on-road mobile source emissions, which specifically looks at total emissions reduction for each of the different pollutants and precursors that Dr. Cog is subject to through our federal air quality conformity requirements. I'll start with our traffic congestion reduction performance measures. Again, that's annual hours of peak hour excessive delay and non-single occupancy vehicle travel. Um, we set these targets because as of October 1st of last year, Federal Highway determined that we met all the criteria on your screen. We were a designated urbanized area. We have national highway system mileage. Our population is over 200,000. And we were a non-attainment or maintenance area for ozone, CO, or particulate matter. Uh, for those that remember an earlier presentation in the year, we have fallen out of maintenance for carbon monoxide. We do expect to fall out of maintenance for particulate matter later in the year. We do still have to go through the process to be redesignated by EPA. So um, as of October 1st of last year, which is the key date, we met all of these. And so we're required to set targets. Uh, a key piece of this is that we also set targets jointly with CDOT. So when it comes time to take action, both Dr. Cog and CDOT take the same action and adopt the same targets for the region. Now the region is specifically the Denver Aurora Colorado urbanized area. So uh, that includes the area on your screen. Uh, it does not include areas that are under the Boulder UZA, the Longmont UZA or the Lafayette Louisville Erie UZA. So those are different geographies uh, and they don't meet the population threshold to set these targets. So when we're talking about the data used and the targets being set, it's specific to the Denver Aurora Colorado urbanized area. This is actually the second time we're setting targets. So I'll go into show both tables on your screen right now. Um, there are two-year targets and four-year targets. So I'm showing uh, whether we met target or we were better than the baseline for each of these. Looking at each of the tables, moving from left to right, we have our performance measures, the desired trend that we wanted to see as we were setting these targets, the baseline values that we saw when we set these targets, and then our two-year and four-year targets compared to what we actually saw in the data for each of those periods, either two years or four years. Uh, for each of these, both two and four, we have met our targets. So we were either higher or lower, depending on the trend that we wanted to see in these particular performance measures. Starting with uh, our percent of non-single occupancy vehicle targets, again, it's the Denver Aurora urbanized area. We set both two-year and four-year targets. And the data that we're using is specifically the American Community Survey, five-year data, and how people are getting to work. So it's a really simple calculation, 100% minus the percent of single occupancy vehicle travel or people who drive alone to work. So that can include people, uh, non-SOV can include people who are carpooling, van pooling, using public transportation, bus, light rail, commuter rail, people who walk or bike to work. And it also includes those who are telecommuting or working from home. As with all of our federal targets, uh, they're intended to be realistic and achievable because they are short term. Uh, and like I mentioned, both Dr. Cog and CDOT set the same targets for the region when it comes time to adopt them. We have a MetroVision target of 35% non-SOV travel by 2040. This was the same methodology we used the first round and we're proposing to use the same methodology for the second round. Um, moving from 2012 through 2019, uh, our non-SOV rate hovered around 24%. Uh, I'm sure y'all can also remember the significant transportation investments that have occurred in the region during that time, but we still hovered around 24% in non-SOV travel. And even with the spike in non-SOV travel through the height, the low point of the pandemic where none of us were traveling, you can see that still only jumps to 27.3% because it's five-year data and it is flattening that spike. So Dr. Cog staff are proposing a two-year target of 26.7% and a four-year target of 27.7% uh, starting from 2019 data. And that'll give us the chance at the two-year mark to see whether that 27.3 uh, is holding stable or we can be more aggressive at that four-year mark. So uh, it'll give us time to see how trends as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and travel to work has uh, held steady as returning to pre-pandemic norms or uh, is 
more aggressive in non-SOV trends. The second measure is peak hour excessive delay. So it's the same area, the Denver Aurora urbanized area, both two and four year targets. And the data this time is coming from the National Performance Management Research data set. So that looks at travel time for vehicles, uh, segments along the uh, roadway system. Uh, it looks at occupancy factors that have come from the Federal Highway Administration. We also pair it with data that comes from the Highway Performance Monitoring System. Uh, the calculation is actually pretty uh, complicated. So we've actually relied on CDOT, who developed a uh, learning model to help out with their forecasts. Uh, but it's excessive delay. So are you traveling at 20 miles per hour or 60% of the posted speed limit, whichever is greater? Um, it's peak hour. So that means uh, 6 to 10 in the morning or 3 to 7 in the afternoon, so those peak periods. And uh, then it takes into account the population of the urbanized area. So same federal guidance, they should be realistic and achievable. And CDOT will set the same targets that we do when it comes time. I mentioned CDOT had developed a model. Uh, they developed it for the state, as well as the Fort Collins UZA and the Denver Aurora UZA. They ended up uh, including the data that I mentioned previously, as well as data that they have available through their own travel model, as well as county level population estimates from the state demographer. Uh, they were able to develop uh, a cone of confidence related to different forecasts. And we're actually showing you the upper threshold of that. So our two-year target we're proposing is 15.8 and our four-year target is 17.4. Uh, these are the upper thresholds. So it's a conservative target setting process. Uh, we're suggesting this and CDOT's proposed this uh, to take into account any errors that might exist in the model that they're using, as well as uh, if there's a quicker return to pre-pandemic travel norms than we expect. So for both of these, um, we would like to see values lower than that. And as with the previous measure I mentioned, the, the four-year target can be reevaluated at the two-year mark. So we can see whether we're returning to travel uh, pre-pandemic norms quicker, whether we're uh, keeping delay lower than we expected. So we'll be able to reevaluate that four-year target at the two-year mark. On your screen are the proposed two-year and four-year targets. Like I mentioned, we can check our progress at the two-year mark, and we'll be able to see how our non-SOV trips are uh, performing, whether people are returning to work and uh, driving to work, changing their travel habits. And we can also see if delay is returning to pre-pandemic levels, which were increasing prior to the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 and 2021, as we start to return to a new normal through the pandemic. Halfway through our second piece is on-road mobile source emissions reduction. So again, these relate to the pollutants and the precursors that Dr. Cog sets through our federal air quality conformity standards. Again, a same table, same table setup as what was previously shown, how we did the last time we set these targets. These also had both two-year and four-year targets. Uh, across the board, we did meet the targets or we were better than the baseline. And that second piece is key is whether we were better than the baseline. Uh, if you look at the second table under full performance period and the second row PM10, you'll notice that our baseline is 40.7. Our four-year target was 152 and our four-year observation was 41.3. So that's obviously uh, not meeting the target, but a key piece of our federal measures and determining whether we've made progress or we're working towards making progress is not just whether we met the target, but we can also ask if we were better than the baseline. So 41.3 is higher than 40.7, and we wanna see a higher value. So we can also say that we are making progress across each of these measures. So across the board, you're seeing green check marks for meeting or being better than the baseline for our two-year and four-year targets we set last round. We set these because we're an MPO that has non-attainment or maintenance areas that applies to Dr. Cog as well as the North Front Range MPO north of us. It's the data that gets reported to CMEC, the CMEC public access system by the Federal High Administration. So if you wanted to, you could actually go see the same data that we're using to set these targets. The measure, like I mentioned, is total emissions reduction, but it's for each different pollutant. That's why you were seeing four performance measures for that one type. So nitrogen oxides, volatile organic compounds, carbon monoxide, and particulate matter. The calculation is pretty simple. You add up the emissions reductions that were reported for CMAC funded projects in two year and then four year increments to get uh, an evaluation metric to see whether you've met your two year or four year targets. And this uh, targets are also unique. We cannot support the state's targets like we can for others, uh, but we also set targets that are specific for our region. So CDOT setting them for the state and we're setting our own for our specific planning area. On your screen is eight years worth of baseline data related to the historical emissions that have been reported for CMAC funded projects. Uh, for each of the different pollutants. So nitrogen oxides, 
volatile organic compounds, carbon monoxide and particulate matter. The key here is that there's no real trend across any of the different pollutants. And in some cases, you're seeing massive spikes in the data, like VOCs and CO in 2017 and 2021. And in some cases, you're seeing very negligible reported benefits, like in 2020 for particulate matter. So because these, there is no real trend, uh, there's no real increase or decrease across the different metrics, uh, different pollutants that we're following. Uh, the staff proposal ended up looking at three different methodologies. I'm showing you a summary slide of what a four-year target would look like if we took a different scenario each time. Uh, moving left to right, we start with our baseline. So each of those different pollutants you saw on your screen added up for the previous four fiscal years gives us our baseline value that we're going to be comparing to. Uh, moving left to right, these targets get more aggressive. Uh, in some cases, they are doubling, like once you get to the benefits per dollar column on the far right. So they're very unlikely that we're going to meet them. But each of these were based around different scenarios. So looking back was looking at the last four fiscal years, what was the lowest value that we saw reported? And what if we commit to achieving that every year over the next four years? So our two-year target would have been that times two, and our four-year target would have been that value times four. Taking the average, tried to smooth out some of those spikes we saw in the data. So looking at an average across all eight years of baseline data that we had, um, that also gave us some pretty aggressive targets across the different metrics. Uh, and in some cases we were higher than what the state's expecting. And then the last scenario is based off of CDOT's own methodology that they developed for the state targets, um, developing a benefit per dollar and calculating that with how much money Dr. Cog has obligated for CMAC funding. Um, in most cases, you're seeing a doubling of what the baseline value was, so highly unlikely that we would meet these targets. And across some of these, we were also higher than what the state expects to achieve across the full state. <laughs> Uh, through our work with CEDA, we also found out that in terms of the number of projects, Dr. Cog contributes roughly 74% to the state CMAC program. And in the last four fiscal years that are our baseline period, uh, we were 80% of the state's admission reduction benefits that got reported. So we were a significant piece of the state CMAC program. I've included the second bullet point just to respect uh, and show that we do have a target in Metrovision related to surface transportation related GHG emissions. Um, but we are proposing that because these are such a prescribed measure and these are focused solely on projects that are funded with CMAC dollars, that we do keep these processes separate. And so our proposed methodology takes into account that for each of these different pollutants, Dr. Cog has contributed over the last four fiscal years a different percentage to the state's emission reduction benefits that were reported. So for VOC, that's 86%, uh, PM10, 66%. CO 95% and NOx 73%. Our proposal is that we look at CDOT's forecast for the two-year targets. Um, you can see those now on the screen for each of the different pollutants. And we commit to achieving our percentage of the state's uh, emission reduction benefits based on what we achieved the last four years. So for our two-year target for VOC, we would contribute 86% of CDOT's forecast to 243. So our proposed target is 209.971. And that's the same for each of the pollutants on your screen now. That uh, methodology holds for the four-year targets as well. So again, taking our percentage, our contribution to the state's targets for each of these pollutants, looking at what they have forecast with their own methodology for the state and contributing that across the full four-year reporting period. So CDOS forecast for VOC is 490 kilograms per day. We're proposing that we contribute our proportion of 86%. So our four-year target for the region would be 423.397. Across all of these, we do want to see higher values than the baseline or the two-year and four-year targets when it comes time to evaluate. Uh, we can reevaluate the four-year target at the mid-performance period, same with my, the previous metrics that I mentioned. Uh, that'll also be a great time because we'll have gone through our calls for projects with the TIP, and we'll have a better idea of what's funded in the TIP with CMAC dollars and what could potentially be obligated over the next four years and whether we're on track to meet our four-year target or whether we're um, too conservative or too aggressive and reevaluate that at that point. Both TAC and RTC have recommended approval of the targets. Um, even after we go before you and get action, we still have another deadline that we're working towards, which is having a CMAC performance plan due to CDOT by September 1st. That includes information like the baseline values that I was talking about across those four fiscal years for CMAC. Um, we also talk about what projects we anticipate being completed, obligated over the next four fiscal years in the reporting period and how we anticipate whether we're gonna meet those targets. 
So for transparency, all two and four year targets that are also included in the memo, um, and they'll also be included in a board resolution that gets submitted with other uh, documentation to both CDOT and the Federal Highway Administration. And the requested motion before y'all to open up questions frame discussion is to move to adopt a resolution adopting the traffic congestion reduction and on-road mobile source emissions reduction targets for the Denver Aurora Colorado urbanized area and the Denver Regional Council of Governments as part of federal performance-based planning and programming requirements. I appreciate it very much. Uh, let me first solicit uh, any comments or questions from members. Seeing none, can I solicit a uh, someone to make a motion? Please raise your hand. No fair rushing. There we go. Director Conklin. Mr. Chair, I move to adopt a resolution adopting the traffic congestion, <clears throat> excuse me, reduction and on-road mobile source emissions reduction targets to the Denver Aurora, Colorado urbanized area and the Denver Regional Council of Governments as part of federal performance-based planning and programming requirements. Thank you. Uh, I thought I saw Nick Williams hand up uh, to second. second. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Director Conklin, do you have a question? No, okay. Uh, just to clarify, Alvin, could you, we, uh, because we meet these criteria that you mentioned, we are required to adopt uh, uh, these, uh, targets uh, but in the presentation we show we have a green check mark as long as we're making progress toward them whether we've met them or not is that correct correct so when it comes time to evaluate whether um the, the broader question is are we making progress so the feds will ask first do we meet our target um across most of all of the ones except one that I showed you, we did meet our target. Uh, but if we don't, the second question is, were we at least better than the baseline? And so that's where that second question comes in. We did across all of our different metrics, we were better than our baseline. So there's that two question test that the feds will ask when it comes time to evaluate the next two and four year targets that we set. Thank you. And then to be clear, what are the consequences, if any, of not meeting the 20, uh, 24, 26, or I'm sorry, what were the years, 22 and 24, 24 and 26? Yeah, 24 and 26 will be the reevaluation periods for the reporting period. So what are, um, the, what are the consequences, if any? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I always find something new to add to these slides, so I will add that to the overview slide for future presentations. Uh, but across these, there are no financial penalties for Dr. Cog. Um, we might have some reporting requirements, help CDOT with their own questions if we don't meet targets. And then when it comes time to be certified by the Federal High Administration and the Federal Transit Administration, which occurs every four years, uh, we could receive some scrutiny from our federal partners, uh, some questions about what are we doing uh, to achieve these targets? Why didn't we? What do we think we're doing differently that could help us through our planning process? So while there's no real financial penalty, we could see additional scrutiny during our certification process. Thank you. I, I, I asked that question because I thought it would be a good segue into the next informational uh, briefing that we have on uh, GHG. Uh, we have a motion on the floor. Do uh, any member have a question or comment? Seeing none, let me uh, ask for a vote. All those in favor of adopting this resolution, please say aye. 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 Is there anyone aye. opposed? Thank you. Is there anyone opposed to adopting this? Say no. Seeing none, any uh, abstentions? Hearing none, the motion is adopted. Thank you very much, uh, Alan. Thank you. I appreciate all your work on that. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is um, uh, 2050 Regional Transportation Plan Greenhouse Gas Analysis Mitigation Measures Update. This, is, uh, this might be a little tougher than the last discussion. Uh, is Ron doing this? Mr. Mr. Please. Chair, this is Ron. Jacob Rieger is giving the presentation today, along okay. with Andy Taylor. Okay, because said Ron on the uh, on the agenda, but I thought Jacob did this at RTC. So, Jacob, take the floor. Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will give the presentation along with my colleague Andy Taylor. But if you have any hard questions, those go to Ron. <laughs> well, that's why he's on the agenda. Got that's it. right. Thank um, you. Give me <laughs> 
Give me just a second. I realize I didn't turn my camera on. Good evening, everyone. Um, so at your June 1st board work session meeting, we gave you an update, kind of a technical update of where we were in the modeling and technical process. Tonight, we want to dig in specifically to one particular aspect of that, uh, which is the mitigation measures that are provided for under the GHG rule. So first, just as a reminder, I'm going to say this at every meeting just to keep reminding us, under the GHG rule, our revised 2050 regional transportation plan that responds to the requirements, addresses the requirements of the state GHG rule is due by October 1st of this year, so that's the deadline that we're aiming for. Um, based on the technical analysis that we have done so far, um, we believe that the 2050 regional transportation plan is adopted. Um, can achieve about 70 to 80 percent of the reduction targets uh, with strategies tested so far. Uh, we've talked about these in previous meetings, um, telework, rate adjustments. We spent a lot of time talking about quantifying programmatic investments, the non-project specific investments that are really important um, in our regional transportation plan. And we've also talked a little bit about project mix changes um, in the spirit of the GHG rule. So we're testing multiple strategies. We know it's going to take multiple strategies to get us there. Um, however, even when we do all of those things, um, doesn't quite get us all of the way there. Uh, we think that we will need mitigation measures uh, to close the remaining gap. Um, that's what we're going to focus on tonight. Um, I've shown you this or versions of this before just to try and make big picture sense of um, kind of the process outlined under the rule and the workflow of what we're doing. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about number one, which is the baseline and how the state rule uh, defines the baseline um, as the purpose for analysis. Uh, we've also spent a lot of time on number two, talking about telework, those programmatic investments, some of those initial strategies uh, that we've been looking at to see how far we can get towards meeting the reduction targets. Uh, we've also spent some time on number three, uh, which is talking about the investments in the plan, um, moving some of the BRT uh, corridors uh, sooner in the plan to accomplish them sooner, um, a few changes to other projects in the spirit of the GHG rule um, so that we can capture the GHG benefits of, of that work um, towards meeting the reduction targets. So tonight we're going to talk about number four, um, again, the sort of process of mitigation measures as provided for in the GHG rule. Um, all in service towards, again, kind of closing that gap. Um, despite all of these strategies, as I said, we know that we've still got um, a bit of a remaining gap and we're still working to try and figure out, um, you know, what, what constellation of strategies. Um, I've used the analogy of a layer cake. These all are sort of cumulative um, together. Um, it's not going to take just one or two strategies. It's going to take several um, in order to meet the emission reduction targets. And we think part of that, um, part of that mix is going to be mitigation measures. So we've mentioned this before, but just as a reminder, mitigation measures were provided for in the state GHG rule when it was adopted. Um, they were further sort of um, articulated in what's now known as Policy Directive 1610 that was recently adopted by the State Transportation Commission, uh, which outlines specific mitigation measures um, and in, provides a scoring sort of mechanism to them. Um, these measures are things, as it says, it's not performance measures per se, um, but they're initiatives or they're things that you can do. For us in particular, we're looking at things that um, not are already not part of our modeling process, already part of our technical analysis, part of our plan, because we've already captured those things and we've been able to capture some of the mitigation measures directly in our modeling work or otherwise in our technical analysis. So we're looking at things, we're looking at potential mitigation measures that we haven't been able to capture in our GHG analysis so far. Um, so again, these are more sort of policy oriented. Uh, we're looking at in particular sort of land use, parking things, we'll get into those um, in just a moment. But we're looking at things that are outside kind of the modeling environment, outside of the 2050 RTP environment, um, but specific things that will help uh, we think close that gap and get us there in terms of meeting the reduction targets specified in the rule. Um, as I said, in the in policy directive 1610 that outlines the mitigation measures, assigns a metric ton reduction to specific activities, again, that aren't otherwise accounted for in our modeling or technical analysis. Um, you've heard me say at previous meetings that we're looking for things that are specific, um, they're measurable, um, they work for this region, there's something that we can measure that we can track over time. Um, so there's a lot of sort of requirements to that. Um, and if we, if we go down the mitigation measures report per the GHG rule, the Dr. Cog board would be asked to adopt a mitigation action plan um, that would require an annual status report of sort of tracking how the region is doing in terms of um, beginning to implement some of these mitigation measures. So with that background and context, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, um, Andy Taylor, to walk through some of the very specific things that we're looking at. Andy? So yeah, um, 
My team has been looking at some of these mitigation measure options that were adopted by the Transportation Commission as part of this uh, uh, PD 1610. Uh, just knowing that we had likely still have that gap, we began looking at those as soon as um, uh, we've had some early drafts. Um, just trying to understand for many of these options, um, did we start on the parking one? Sorry, let me go back. There we go. Um, so for many of the options uh, the commission adopted, Dr. Cog was already able to account for them in the travel modeling work um, as Jacobs describes. So we were really focused um, and, and are still focused on understanding how we could uh, look at the parking um, uh, potential measures uh, and the land use measures. And the parking measures outlined by the commission include two that, that have an unclear policy mechanism of just how uh, it would move from um, some sort of uh, local action, how that would be um, adopted um, to add either an additional parking fee or uh, what folks consider unbundling the parking cost uh, from rent. So for, this would primarily be uh, for uh, residential, uh, uh, new residential development. Uh, but uh, changing parking code and local development uh, uh, codes, the parking requirement um, they have outlined several options for us um, that we could follow eliminating the minimum and setting a low maximum for all new residential and then also uh, reducing or eliminating the minimum and setting a moderate maximum for new residential and uh, on the commercial side um, they focus primarily based on the uh, the requirements that they've calibrated this to are primarily focused on on office uses and so that would not it, it's difficult to see exactly how um, this would apply to other uses retail uh, restaurants uh, other entertainment type uses that may actually have already in your codes uh, a higher requirement per square foot um, we also know that that setting a maximum eliminating minimums uh, may be much easier than uh, setting a maximum. It may not be feasible in all markets uh, based on uh, uh, just the economics or, or politically locally. Um, so that's what I mean when I'm saying uh, the maximums may not be feasible um, everywhere. So uh, next slide. Uh, land use mitigation measures are a bit more straightforward. Um, they all tie back to rezoning. Uh, they're all about allowing for increased density, uh, but these are all local decisions. And so they're up to you and, and your colleagues on, on your councils and commissions. Uh, furthermore, uh, many communities have already been planning for significant change as a region has built out a rapid transit system. Uh, many have switched to allow more development by right with their base zoning or have already adopted specific zoning for sites through plan unit development. Um, uh, that custom zoning opportunity that many of you have uh, in your communities. And so um, it's, it's unclear just looking at the data that we have about how many opportunities there really are to, to see uh, increased possibilities for development through just rezoning. So um, that's more of a potential barrier of just trying to uh, close that knowledge gap uh, between what, what we work with at a regional level and, and seeing uh, more what's available at the local level. Um, so we did some initial analysis. Next slide. Uh, without diving deep into that specific zoning, our initial analysis looked at some key geographies and the potential development or redevelopment opportunities therein. Um, so we looked at the improvement to land value ratio. Uh, each county for each parcel, uh, you're assessing the improvement value of the buildings and other improvements on the site, those are being assessed separately from the land. Um, and, to, and so we can compare those two values. So when the improvement value divided by the land value is zero, uh, we can assume that the, the site is vacant or, or unimproved. Um, similarly, when it's uh, low, when it's under one or even under two, we could say, all right, the land is worth more than the improvements on the site or it's pretty close and so this gives us a sense of where there might be uh, opportunities where there might be um, uh, opportunities for uh, more growth uh, more development 
so this analysis gives us a sense of where we can see additional density uh, through development in terms of raw acres. The columns are, are exclusive. So we started with rail stations, but we didn't want to double count as we went through these columns. So even as some of these areas overlap where there are rail stations and, and uh, potential future BRT stations, urban centers, some of these have some overlap. So we didn't want to double count those, but it also lets us uh, look sum those across and have that total column. And so I think there's going to be a green box that'll show up here uh, on the next click. There you go. Um, this gives us a sense of, of really how much acreage there may be for us to, to work at, in in just these specific key geographies uh, without, at this point, the caveat of getting into um, specific zoning. I will note that the analysis here, we excluded protected open space because that would often uh, show up as, as vacant. Um, and we also didn't include parcels smaller than a half acre. So we wanted to, to note where there were already places that were, were very subdivided um, and, and maybe harder land assembly for uh, redevelopment of the scale that, that these measures are looking at. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is what it looks like as a chart. So recognizing that, that uh, uh, some folks uh, might appreciate the visual and not just the numbers on the chart, uh, you can see just how many of these uh, acres in these key geographies already have some significant level of improvement on them just based on this re really coarse metric. Uh, so if we drop that that high column, you, you may be able to see a little bit better about the amounts that we're working on. So uh, next slide. So this, get, this just drops that last uh, category. And so we're looking at everything three uh, and under for that improvement to land value uh, ratio. And so this shows just how many opportunities we may have, but also um, where we, we may not have quite as many um, as we may need. And so that's the math that we're working through right now to just understand how that's gonna translate from, from potential acres uh, to the different points, or ultimately the end of the day, uh, the, the uh, amount uh, we may need to close that remaining gap uh, to our target. Uh, by adopting some of these mitigation measures. Thanks very much, Andy. So just to put a bow on this a little bit, um, again, we do believe that mitigation measures will be needed to achieve the state GHG targets, greenhouse gas targets. Um, as Andy indicated, we're analyzing the feasibility and the applicability of parking management and land use related measures from policy directive 1610. Um, this is what Andy just walked you through. Um, but we're also considering some other measures outside of Policy Directive 1610 to help achieve the greenhouse gas reduction levels. Um, and I'm just going to click these through here. I'm not going to go through each of these individually. Um, but these, the point of some of these here, um, adopting local complete street standards and some of the other things that you see here, is that it's not just about um, meeting the reduction targets and, and addressing the requirements of the rule, as important as that is. Um, it's really about affecting positive change for the region through our planning process. So we're trying to look at this holistically and not just kind of meet the targets on paper, um, but actually do things that will make a difference in this region, uh, meaningful things that we can implement together and work together as a region um, to implement through this process. So with that, um, we would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, it was not letting me unmute. Uh, questions from... Uh... Directors, please. I have a few maybe to kick us off. Uh, well, let me let uh, Director Spear go first then. Go ahead. Oh, that's fine, Chair. If you want to go first, please. No, 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 please. please. Okay. No, please um, I, I guess, you know, the question that I have is these things all sound wonderful. And, you know, frankly, I would love to see my community do them. Uh, but what are the incentives? <laughs> you know, what, what is it other than just sort of saying, hey, folks, we really all need to come together, or we're going to miss our targets. Um, what is it that's going to get communities to do this? Is that a wrong yeah. question, uh, Jacob? <laughs> I well, think the incentive is a stick. It's not yeah. a carrot. <laughs> um, let me let me start an answer and then maybe uh, invite Ron to pitch in. Maybe I'll come back to this slide um, right. to kind of to kind of help do that. Um, I mean, look, the point here is that 
first of all, um, it's actually sort of the opposite question that I was anticipating, which is, oh no, we're gonna have to do all these things. Um, how do we do that? The point of a mitigation action plan is not um, that we do these things by October 1st. It's to say that, you know, if we're going to adopt mitigation measures and we're gonna put them in a mitigation action plan, um, that there are things that the region together commits to. We think of them on a regional level. We measure them on a regional level. It's not jurisdiction specific. Um, it's something that we're, we're doing as a region um, in order to, you know, to meet um, the greenhouse gas reduction targets first and foremost as part of our overall strategy. Um, but again, to help um, affect positive change in the region. Some of the things that you're seeing on this slide in particular are things that, yes, maybe delve into stick care, um, stick uh, territory. Uh, maybe we can try to think of them as carrots. But, you know, again, in affecting good planning, we're trying to think about things that either from an incentive perspective or, you know, a carrot perspective or a stick perspective, things that we can incorporate in our planning process to kind of both incentivize and prompt uh, local governments and in our region to work together um, to do some of these things. I think that's the overall context. Ron, I'll invite you if you wanna give more specifics. Um, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it's tough and we're still trying to figure out, I think I will start by reiterating one of the key points around this work is that we believe that it's appropriate and prudent to be very strategic about the specific geographies where some of these might be might be applied because we want to do this in places where we think we can achieve success, right? Which is why you saw that focus on areas that are already designated as station areas where there is light rail, um, there are light rail stations um, already in place or where we have planned investments in a bus rapid transit corridor and we want to facilitate um, increased development to take advantage of those regional investments in transit facilities. Um, so being very, very strategic about where these things might apply, I think is the first step. I, th I think the second step is Dr. Cog as an agency can play a really key role in providing best practices and support for local governments to, to be able to do these things. And um, so if, if there was some request or requirement that local communities that had some of these geographies within their jurisdictions to adopt things like transit design standards as part of their development codes. Um, we can provide resources to both help develop those, develop best practices, develop model codes. Um, so we can support, um, that's the carrot side. Um, we could think about uh, perhaps giving, uh, giving tip score bonuses to, to jurisdictions that um, do certain things. So there, there, are, there can be those types of incentives in terms of directing our future tip investments uh, to jurisdictions or areas that, that, it, that um, pursue these, these options. Um, and there can, be, there can be sticks, and I'm not proposing this, but there can be, the, there could be things that where uh, the region thinks that it's important for local jurisdictions to take some steps towards these. Um, there could be limitations on eligibility for future TIP funds, not a restriction on getting funds, perhaps not even maybe uh, a score reduction on a TIP application, but maybe a jurisdiction is only eligible for, for certain types of projects if they haven't done something. Um, and so we're, we're exploring all of those. We're trying to put together some very reasonable, achievable things. We recognize that many of these uh, measures aren't broadly applicable evenly across the entire region. Um, every, every community in this region, every neighborhood in this region is unique. Uh, and that's why we're trying to be very strategic about what we're exploring and how we might put a package together uh, if we need to, to close a final uh, greenhouse gas uh, reduction level uh, gap. I hope that helps uh, Director Spear. Yeah, that does, thank you. And I just wanted to offer um, as well that, you know, I think some of these things you're talking about, like the support that's being given, um, the resources being created, being adopted, all of these seem like really good um, leading indicators to me of whether we're going to be on track. Um, so 
you know, I, I imagine that this is all information you are um, keeping track of anyway, but um, in addition to having these uh, other kinds of measures of reductions that are more lag indicators, I think having this information along the way seems um, really valuable. And I got to tell you, I mean, if you want to put some sample legislation together that I can start working <laughs> with Boulder on to address some of these parking maximum issues and density, I mean, I would be thrilled to work on some of that, frankly. So um, anyway, so just just know that you know I, I think those the resources will, will be a really good incentive for those of us who are interested in pushing some of these things forward. Thank you. Uh, next up is Director Levy. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank, thanks for the presentation. Um, what I'm wondering about is um, is the lag between say a, a local government adoption of, of some of these provisions into their development codes and actual redevelopment and the realization of, of uh, the modeled um, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So how do we, how does our um, mitigation action plan and our modeling account for the fact that say, say we get incredible response to these proposals and a lot of, of the, the member governments here at Dr. Cog adopt them, one or all, uh, but there's there's no redevelopment activity that's actually consistent with these with these plans. H how do we account for that? I I think that's why we're considering some uh, measures that are outside of um, what CDOT has outlined, since theirs are exclusively focused on rezoning. And yet, I think we all have seen places in our communities that have very generous zoning, but for whatever reason. Uh, there is something in the way, uh, whether it's uh, market demand at, at that moment, maybe it's uh, uh, some, some difficulty with, with developing the site. Um, and so we've been looking at some of our other peers uh, that have some similar uh, uh, targets that they need to meet related to greenhouse gas emissions and how they're trying to shape growth and development and just trying to really focus in, not just on rezoning, but are there other ways that, that we can um, identify uh, those issues, those blockers to redevelopment and, and have a more holistic approach, knowing that it's not just always about zoning. Yeah, Director Levy, I'd add to that. Andy's right. Some of the mitigation measures, <clears throat> excuse me, the way they're structured are about you know, rezoning or, or sort of policy oriented, right? So that's the first step. But in terms of, you know, actually capturing once you rezone, you know, what happens in terms of development, um, again, apologies for my voice, um, you know, what happens in terms of actual building activity and redevelopment over time as, as these areas start to develop or redevelop and we capture that in our land use forecasts, um, that's another way, because this is an iterative process. I mean, all planning is sort of a, a snapshot in time. This is not the only time we'll be doing this. So as we go forward, uh, through the years. The first step is the mitigation measures as structured, but the second step, tracking the progress of those, the second step is as actual tangible things start to happen, being able to capture that in our land use forecasts, in our modeling, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks. This this is still, I know I've, I always ask a lot of questions about the mitigation measures strategy because it's, it's still just very amorphous in terms of you know, when we actually get to uh, reviewing projects, um, you know, in the next tip cycle, um, you know, I think I, I'm just anticipating a, a little bit of a mismatch here where if, if the mitigation measures haven't really come to fruition, but yet we, we've got them in our RTP and our greenhouse gas reduction strategy, um, it, it's it, it's just not coming together for me. I'm sorry. It's not. It's it's me and not you. Where I've heard that before. <laughs> uh, thank you. Is that all, Director? Yes. Okay. It is. Uh, Director Coombs, you're up. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so my question is, perhaps in response to some of the things that Ron said to Director Spear um, about how communities might be either incentivized with carrots or sticks. And in Aurora, it's a very large community with some significant variety in the types of development. So I think there are some areas where 
it would make a lot of sense to implement all of these. And there are some areas where if we implemented this, I know that the representatives for those particular areas, for those wards, would be extremely upset that, that anything like parking, um, you know, reducing parking minimums when they live in areas that aren't served by public transit, for example, um, would be concerning. And so I'm wondering, we have, for example, in our development code, different sub areas of the city to reflect those significant differences. Um, would that kind of variation um, be considered in terms of whether or not we've met certain mitigation measures? Yeah, yeah thanks for your question, Director. Yeah. Oh. Um, Andy and I are probably going to say the same thing, yeah. but just we're trying to we're trying to when we do this technical analysis of potential mitigation measures, we're trying to match the methodology of the measure to the geography that makes sense for the measure, and we're trying to account um, for the very things that you're saying. And that's why on this slide, um, again, when you see these specialized areas, um, you know we're trying to match the potential measure to the area in which it's most likely to be effective and most likely to be implemented. Um, I think to account for some of the some of the things that you've brought up. Andy, did I get it right? Yeah, I, the, the thing I would add is that every little bit helps. It's definitely not a one size fits all approach. This should not be seen as something that we need to uh, institute across entire jurisdictions. We still get credit for, um, in the part, case of parking, it's per uh, thousand dwelling units that could be built. Uh, we, get, we get a credit um, to, towards this. So, so it doesn't have to be everywhere. It, it can be uh, a much more targeted approach. And, and Director Coombs, this is Ron. It, it would not be everywhere. I think that's that's the key. And I'm sorry I didn't say that clearly enough. I think that we we are focusing in on very specific geographies. Uh, Andy, what's the if you if you think about sort of those those geographies here that are between zero and two uh, in terms of the ratio of improvements to land value? What percentage of the region's total area is that roughly? It's a very small percent. I think one point in time we have looked at, I remember tallying up urban centers and that this is just showing existing urban centers, but we have a, a, a wide variety uh, existing planned uh, emerging. I think it's 1% of the region for just urban centers. So uh, with some of these areas, it, it is a very um, fine grained uh, approach here. Thank you. And thank you, Director Coombs, for your questions, because you uh, struck at the heart of what, what I was going to ask in the beginning. And so I'm glad that it came uh, from you as well, because I maybe uh, not now, uh, uh, Jacob, uh, Andy, or Ron, but maybe at a future work session when we take this up yet again, uh, it would be helpful for me and maybe other directors to understand the, uh, the mathematics, the, the uh, calculus behind uh, determining that these are actually mitigating measures and not aggravating factors. Uh, because as uh, Director Coombs was alluding, I believe, uh, increasing residential density in, in just any area, uh, for instance, my neck of the woods in Southwest Denver, where there's very little access to, uh, to alternate modes, uh, every, every additional household that you add in my, in my part of town uh, creates more carbon footprint, creates more VMT because people have to drive somewhere. I'd like to see a calculation that says uh, that uh, removing parking minimums or setting low maximums uh, has some kind of an impact uh, because is the assumption that if we don't provide parking, people won't have a car. Uh, because I know people who rely on transit on their, on their, uh, their work commute uh, might also have a car. Uh, if you ever tried to park in Denver's Capitol Hill neighborhood, one of the most transit-rich areas of the metropolitan uh, area, uh, you'll see, you'll find uh, my my younger son used to live there. Uh, on occasion, he had to park uh, four or five blocks away from his apartment uh, because everybody has cars. Uh, so I'm I'm wondering what the calculus is and how how do we how do we say well because you haven't met your target, you have to do away with parking. And I'm wondering if that means people won't have a car or that they'll just drive around the block five more times looking for a, a parking place and actually create more GHG by doing so. So maybe at a future meeting, show us the math, you know, show your work. That would be helpful for me. Director Teal. Don't, don't tell me you want, uh, you're asking me to give you Daniel's park right here, right? Okay. 
I, I can't do that here. We, we can talk about it later. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, but actually, uh, uh, actually jumping on to what the chairman was talking about, um, uh, perhaps also where do these locations map to? And perhaps a, um, um, uh, when it's brought forward before the board for another work session, actually mapping these areas out so that we can all uh, have an opportunity to uh, take a look at our individual communities and kind of kind of get a feel um, uh, kind of for the feasibility. And, and then how many are applicable to our own communities? That's probably an easy answer for me as a county commissioner, but I would think that would be a little more um, uh, of a challenge uh, or perhaps very enlightening in my former role on the Castle Rock Council. I would imagine I have uh, several fellow um, board members who could see value in uh, a graphic presentation of mapping these areas that are on um, these key geographies um, for a future work session. And, and then Kevin, we'll yeah. talk more about Daniel's Park, brother. <laughs> Yeah, Director Teal, thank you. We'd be happy to do that because we've actually, in, in starting this analysis, that's where we started, uh, was with the GIS analysis of uh, trying to identify these appropriate areas and, and make some assumptions and calculations around them. So more than happy to show that work. You know, and actually just as a quick follow-up, Jacob, I know that we're planning on having you into our sub-regional uh, committee in Douglas. Do you think that could be something prepared in time for that? Or do you think that would be something... Um, you need more time. I think we could do it. So I, I think I'm going to, um, sorry, I might give a brief update tomorrow, but I think you're referring to the one in early July. And I think by then we can do that. Okay. Phenomenal. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Director Kondo, you had your hand up. Uh, did you take it down intentionally or do you have a question? Actually, Director Teal, and I, I think the prior respondents were getting on to the right thing. I was going to ask about the Esri Arctis analysis, mm -hmm. which uh, in my prior life working in emergency planning, I found to be very insightful when you're trying to correlate several factors together. So I, I often wonder if you're trying to figure out, you know, trying to locate where your workforce is, what their transportation habits or proclivities might be, and then, you know, trying to figure out how you can cross-correlate that with, you know, developing the new residential areas for set people. But it sounds like you guys do have that tool. I, I think it would be very useful to do that analysis. Thank you. Any other questions for uh, Jacob? Andy, uh, Director Spear, go ahead. I just had um, one, one more question come up as folks were um, talking about this and thank you, it was a very helpful discussion as well. Um, is there a role anywhere in here for some of these sort of last mile kinds of solutions? Like I'm thinking about um, how we have the B-cycle program, the Lime scooters, the, um, I know Denver's been doing a lot with e-bike rebates, basically, um, you know, or car shares or other things that could be um, added um, that might help decrease people's need to have cars in some of these areas. Yeah, thank you, Director Spear. Um, yes, is the short answer. Um, the slightly longer answer is that I would put those in the category on this flow chart of step number two. Um, I'd call that the non-project specific programmatic investments and that, as I've alluded to, and you've probably heard me speak at previous meetings, uh, was actually a big part of our initial analysis. Everything you mentioned, but really more than that, things that aren't necessarily identified as major projects in a 30 year plan are shown on a map, but what I call the connective tissue of our multimodal transportation system, things that we need to invest in to make our transportation system work and be well maintained and evolve over time. Um, it really is the spirit of those programmatic investments. We know that they have a big impact in terms of GHG emissions. And we actually spent a lot of time trying to quantify those and the GHG benefits of those um, based on um, the significant investment of them or uh, in them, I should say, in our 2050 regional plan. Um, so yes, I think those are accounted for at a, at a regional long-term level. Great, thank you. Great, thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Jacob, thank you, Andy, uh, Ron as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Last Chair. Call for, last, last call for any questions? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next item 11, which is uh, the annual uh, fast track status report. And as was noted, at the beginning of the meeting and roll call, uh, my friend Bill Van Meter 
uh, is actually at his uh, his boss's uh, meeting tonight. Uh, RTD board has a work session tonight, so he is not here. But I understand that my friend Susan Wood is here. Matt Helfant, uh, you're going to introduce uh, Susan for the annual report. Great, you have to unmute yourself. Muting. Sorry about Great. that. <laughs> no All problem. right. Um, yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, Matthew Helfant, Senior Transportation Planner. Um, a Dr. Cog resolution from September of 2013 requires RTD to provide a fast track annual status report to Dr. Cog at the beginning of May each year. Uh, your meeting packet includes the 2022 report, answers uh, to questions that Dr. Cog uh, staff submitted to RTD about the report and RTD's PowerPoint presentation for this evening. And uh, as, as the chairman said, uh, we have Susan Wood from RTD to walk you through uh, highlights of this year's report. And I am going to share my screen because I have the power. So just one moment. Thank you. Welcome, Susan. Good to see you. Well, it's good to see you too, Chair, and also many other faces that I recognize or have worked with in the past. So thanks so much for having me tonight. And I will start by saying thanks so much to Matthew and to Jacob as well for uh, helping us re prepare this report each year, for reviewing it, for asking the good questions. And, and, uh, and this has gone on for a number of years at this point in time. As Matthew said, uh, we are required to prepare an annual annual report on fast tracks to Dr. Cog, and um, Jake or Matthew. Next slide. We'll jump right in. Um, we've been preparing these since 2004, when uh, the voters approved uh, the fast tracks program. So again, as Matthew said, this is uh, pursuant to Senate Bill 208, which actually dates back to 1990. Um, in, as required by Senate Bill 208 and subsequent resolutions by Dr. Cog, um, each report includes a status of Fast Tracks projects, as does this one, also information on uh, the Fast Tracks financial plan and status. And um, in this case, we've also included some updates um, that were requested uh, through um, uh, questions that came uh, after the report was submitted, and that's information on the uh, Longmont first and main station, and also on the reimagine uh, program and specifically the mobility plan for the future. Next slide. So th uh, this table really just shows uh, the fast tracks projects that have been completed and the dates of completion. Um, many of the fast tracks projects have been completed. There are several that are outstanding. Southwest corridor extension, central corridor extension, um, North Metro from 124th to 162nd, and then the, the next phase of Northwest Rail um, from Westminster to Longmont. Um, but again, this is a status of, this is a report or a table reporting those completed uh, fast tracks projects. Next slide. Um, and this table actually uh, reports the uh, budget and expenditures for all of the fast tracks projects. The column on the right, the total project budget, that's all of the funding for each project that is allocated or has been allocated today for the project. And then the column on the left are the expenditures that have been, uh, have been made through the end of this past December 2021. For example, the Central Corridor Extension has a total budget of 11.7 million. 11.7 have, have been spent. You look at Southeast, a little different story. The total project budget is 232.9 million. But through twenty through the end of twenty twenty one, two hundred and five uh, and a half million have been spent, and this really is just showing um, a budget that still remains in the project, even though the project has been completed. Again, that's a federally uh, funded project. Contingency funds remain. Uh, next, next slide. So the other thing that is included in the fast tracks report that's in your packet is a, a spreadsheet of the midterm financial plan for fast tracks. And this is a six year plan from 2022 to 2027. And I am hearing an echo of myself. So I don't know if you guys are, I hope not. 
It sounds okay on my end, Susan. All right, very good. I can ignore it and I'll keep going. Um, it, it's a six-year financial plan, the midterm financial plan. Um, there is also a midterm financial plan for the base system and together those are the full fast tracks uh, plan, a midterm financial plan. Again, it's a six year plan. It is a forecast. It's not an appropriation of funding that's required uh, to actually through the budgeting process to actually appropriate the funds. Um, the midterm financial plan was approved by our board this past October. Uh, plan, the plan seeks to balance expenditures with the anticipated or forecast funding. The fast tracks plan does run a deficit but base system funding will supplement the fast tracks plan uh, in order to uh, continue its operation, which of course will continue. Uh, it's set up to allow service to grow over time. And it's based on uh, the current outlook, which is a return to service levels that are 85% of pre COVID levels. The other thing that is a factor that comes into play is the reimagine uh, RTD system optimization plan. And this midterm financial plan is consistent with the service levels that are, that are uh, assumed in, in the uh, uh, system optimization plan. Next slide. The other financial item uh, to mention in talking about fast tracks is the internal savings account or FISA. Um, there's a missing date on this slide, but the FISA was created in December of 2012, and it was intended to be a place where um, the funds from different sources could be put together and saved uh, for the purpose of completing unfinished fast tracks corridors. And the FISA exists today. There are eight sources that were identified to contribute to the FISA. I won't go through all of these. Those are in, in, in the uh, report, and I won't read them, but there are eight. Uh, the total to date that's in the FISA is almost $188 million, uh, and the forecast total for 2040 is a little over $525 million. Another item we had questions on was the Longmont First and Main Station and what the status of that was or is. Uh, this is moving forward. It's expected to be completed in 2025. There is a master plan in place that was completed by RTD and Longmont. Um, and right now there's an intergovernmental agreement that is in the works um, uh, going back and forth to delineate how this will actually be carried out. But again, moving forward, expected to be completed in 2025. Next slide. We also had questions about operator and maintenance staff shortage, an issue which we have as do transit agencies and unfortunately many businesses and public and private sector entities across the country. Um, right now for our bus operators, we have a vacancy uh, ratio of 20.8%. Our light rail operator vacancy ratio a little better at 12%. Our newest collective bargaining agreement though, it does include provisions that are intended to, uh, to, um, uh, to uh, uh, bring on more staff and then to be able to retain that staff. And these include things like um, uh, salary or, or hourly, hourly boost, benefits and boosts, uh, a, a quality, uh, a better quality working environment and things of this nature. So we are truly hoping that, um, we're truly hoping that this will help us um, uh, uh, bring more staff in and be able to retain them as well. Next slide. So briefly, I'll go through the mobility plan for the future and, and uh, as was noted earlier, um, Bill Van Meter would normally be giving this presentation, but he's in a work session with the RTD board on this very subject. The mobility plan for the future, again, is part of the reimagine study that's been underway for uh, a couple of years at this point in time. This slide really shows the number of things that have gone into considering the mobility plan for the future. Uh, there are main categories like uh, guiding principles for reimagine and future needs and opportunities for RTD and stakeholder input. And then with all of those are a number of other items that go with it, with uh, coming to the end point of uh, a mobility plan for the future. Again, that's being discussed by the RTD board tonight. Next slide. So, you know, I think maybe it's, there are some things that are pretty obvious about why complete a mobility, a mobility plan for the future. Um, we have seen a lot of changes in travel patterns with COVID and we, are, we're, we will see an evolution of travel patterns through 2050 and there's a real need to be prepared for that. 
We do have a projected population growth of 30% and a ridership growth, growth of 70%. And we need to account for that and plan for the best way to, uh, to address it and to organize and, and uh, shape the, the service that we provide. We also need to account for emerging technologies and support equity populations. These are the folks that most use our system and also be aware of financial sustainability and maintain that. Community trust is hugely important. Having fiscally constrained, fiscally constrained needs-based plans are important. And we also have a strategic plan that was adopted by our board, I believe about the end of this past year. And it's important for us to integrate performance measures with the measures that are in the strategic plan as well. Next slide. We've been going through a five-step process um, to create the mobility plan for the future, beginning with what success would look like and ending up with developing strategies. I think we're moving toward the end, nearing the end of this process. And again, at the end of the day, what we hope to have is a framework of policies, partnerships, capital investments, and recommendations that will move RTD forward. Next slide. There are some key takeaways that we have received through all the work that's been done and through the stakeholder input that we've also received. Um, again, strong support for service to, for, to equity populations, those who are making the most use of our service and who need us the most. Um, all of the groups we've worked with have favored RTD acting as a mobility integrator. Um, technical working group and the advisory group both support high frequency service to areas where the land use, which has also been talked about tonight, uh, where transit supportive land uses uh, are, are, are or where they are found and they also uh, favor a coverage based system. Uh, preliminary, preliminary board results also indicate that they prefer a coverage based system. We know generally overall their support for more service and even stronger support for more reliable service and also there is a, a, the thought that RTD is the regional transit backbone. They provide that with partnerships to operate and pay for local service. And with that, I will conclude. I'm happy to answer any questions um, and certainly dig deeper into any subject matter that, that you would have greater interest in. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, up first, we have Director Peck. Thank you, and thank you for this presentation. I just have one clarifying uh, question for you. You mentioned that contingency funds were still in projects that have been completed. Did I understand that correctly? And if so, why is that? Yeah. Why are the funds still there? That is a very good question to ask, and I'm glad you did because I could have completed that sentence a little bit better. There, are, it, particularly with the Southeast Rail Extension, there are some contingency funds that are federal funds that are still in the project um, in the project pot at this point in time. That project will be closed out uh, pretty soon. There are a couple of items that need to be completed. Landscaping actually is one of them. And when that happens, the project will close and those federal dollars that have not been spent, which were allocated for that specific project, will go back, uh, will go back to the DOT. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Yeah. Dr. Levy. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, Susan, nice to see you. Nice to um, see you, Director Levy. Yeah. Oh, hi. <laughs> Just just a comment on on your chart your uh, your chart there of the uh, status of projects and completed and, and amounts spent um, and and that's just uh, we we've been here in Boulder County submitting yeah thank you project our comments on the system optimization plan and um, and you know the US thirty six BRT um, is experiencing a lot of service cuts. Uh, service reductions, and so while the the infrastructure, uh, the capital improvements were made, and that's probably what you're tracking through this um, th this slide or this page. I, I just think it's important to keep in mind that the service uh, is actually not being provided um, consistent with what um, Fast Tracks promised the voters. So I just just wanted to make that note. So noted, and you're absolutely right. The numbers that are presented here have to do with the capital expenditure rather than the operating expenditure, which 
is often greater, well, is always greater over the long term, pretty much than the capital outlay initially. Yeah. Thank you, you Director. Uh, up next, Director Spear, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for that um, presentation and, and thank you, Director Levy, for your question um, as well. Um, my question is just whether there is any sort of downward trajectory in the vacancies for operators. <laughs> um, you know, you showed you showed the numbers, but you know, ultimately we kind of want to get some of these services back, which you know I know is is a little bit dependent on just operators. So, are you seeing kind of over time, uh, you know, an increase or a, a sort of decrease in the vacancies? You know, I, I, I don't know the, I'll just tell you, I don't know the exact answer to that. I do know that one thing that we're looking at, though, is now that we do have a, a collective bargaining agreement in place that it really is targeted toward, toward being able to um, draw in and, and retain drivers, we'll be looking at it, if it really does that or not. But I will say this as well, I can get those numbers. I don't have them, but I can get them to Matthew and he can distribute them if there's interest in that. Thank you. Mostly I'm, I'm just looking for, for some hope <laughs> that things will start coming back, especially for flatter and flyer services. Un understood. And I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful there are some hopeful things there and we would like to pass those along. So um, I will look into that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you, Susan. I remember uh, when I was a reporter at the Rocky Mountain News being in the uh, Dr. Cog meeting room in 2004 when the 208 reports were first brought up and, uh, and these uh, annual reports were to be anticipated. Now to be sitting here as the chair overseeing your report is a sort of a, a mind bender for me. Uh, I really appreciate it and thank, uh, thank Bill for us as well. I will do that, and thank you all. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is informational item. If, if uh, people have had a chance to read it, there are three administrative modifications to the 2225 TIP. Uh, there's a report there from uh, uh, Todd Cottrell from staff. Uh, you can read that at your leisure. Uh, committee reports are next. We have up first uh, Director Maurer with a report from the uh, State Transportation Advisory Committee. Hello, everyone. Um, I don't have a, any report um, because there was no meeting in June, but just one update. Um, Director Williams will be taking over for me as the uh, staff changed their meeting time and it was a conflict for me. So that's all I have. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Director Maurer. And uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, did you have something to add to that? Good, okay. Not good that you don't have anything bad, but uh, <laughs> this was your one chance to talk tonight and you blew it. Thank you. Uh, next up is a report from Metro Mayor's Caucus, uh, Director Starker. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. The uh, Metro Mayor's Caucus met for their mid-year retreat on June 1st at the beautiful Sturm Pavilion at the uh, Denver Art Museum. We had a warm welcome from uh, Christopher Heinrich, the Executive Director, and, and uh, we had reports from our standing committees, the Transportation Mobility Committee, uh, the uh, Housing, Hunger and Homelessness Committee, and our Sustainability Committee on uh, what operations had been uh, completed over the final or the past year and what uh, upcoming plans were uh, scheduled for the rest of 2022. <clears throat> Pardon me. We had an update from uh, Mayor uh, Stoltzman from Louisville on the IE IECC update. Uh, about the benefits and opportunities of a cohort approach for moving forward the IECC codes in our billing departments. We had uh, uh, two presentations on resources for financing low and middle income housing. We had a, a, a report back on SB 22232 with Senator Bridges and uh, Mark Falcone with Continuum Partners on on their uh, program there in SB 232. And we had a discussion on Initiative 108 with uh, um, Michael Johnstone and the Gary Community Ventures. Um, we, uh, the docents gave us a very nice tour of the, um, uh, of the uh, museum and we had a very nice reception afterwards. And that concludes my report. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Starker. That is a very nice venue over there. I'm Beautiful. glad you had the opportunity to see it. We got to see it uh, about two months ago. And it was very nice. If anybody has an opportunity to see the new, this is the uh, renovated uh, 
Geoponte, the uh, right. art museum on the Civic Center, and the new pavilion there is just uh, very remarkable. It has a great venue uh, for meetings in it. Uh, next up is uh, Metro Area County Commissioners. Uh, Director Baker, uh, Commissioner Baker is not here today. Let me ask, is there any member of Metro Area County Commissioners who might be able to report in his, in his absence? Uh, if there are none, uh, we will just simply move on then. Uh, report from uh, uh, Area Committee on Aging. Uh, Jayla, you're up. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I presented to the Advisory Committee on Aging uh, that I presented to the Aurora Commission for Older Adults and also to the Commerce City Senior Commission. Um, they asked me to come out to, to give them some information about updated demographics. Uh, we talked a lot about service needs. We talked about um, uh, what services were available and starting up again. Uh, we talked about needs uh, in both communities. They talked the top needs were transportation, nutrition, and housing, which is consistent with what we hear um, in the office as well. Uh, I, uh, we got an update from Rich Morrow, a legislative update. We had a report from our community transitions program. This is a program we contract with the healthcare policy and financing um, uh, from the state um, to outreach to residents living in nursing homes, long-term care facilities to provide information about community living options. Uh, since January, we have uh, 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 had contact with 228 uh, folks living in facilities telling them those who have expressed interest in moving back out to community and helping them do that. So um, that was a report that they hadn't heard about in a long time. I reviewed the monthly activity report for May, highlighting that our community resources team responded to 1,522 calls for the month of May. Our top needs included um, transportation, financial information, and public benefits home care information, and then information about housing and long-term care. I've provided a COVID update. Unfortunately, we're seeing an uptick in COVID, or we were then. I'm hoping it's going to turn around here soon. Um, uh, 83 facilities in their, our metropolitan area, nursing homes and assisted living, um, reporting cases of COVID. Um, we had... Um, uh, we have 26 congregate meal sites open and we were talking about what we might have to do if some of those might have to close for a little while due to the increasing cases of COVID. So COVID is still impacting aging services quite a bit and our ability to serve people. Um, but uh, we're figuring out new ways all the time with our community service providers on how to, how to uh, provide services in a different way so that people who need service can still get it. Things like instead of having a congregate meal site, we'll, we do grab and go meals. Um, staff shortages continue to be a problem for our service providers and still impact our ability to serve all that need um, services in our region. That's my report. Thank you. Thank you, Jayla. And uh, uh, don't, uh, don't think that we have forgotten all the great work you've done just because we re recognized folks at the awards dinner. The need continues and our, our commitment to support uh, continues as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, up next, uh, Regional Air Quality Council Executive Director Rex. I also see that uh, Sheila Lynch has joined us as a panelist. I don't know if you wanted to take the opportunity to have her introduce herself. Uh, as part of, I know it has nothing to do with the RAC, uh, but since you mentioned uh, earlier, go ahead. Bill, what do you think? You wanna say a few words? Sure, hello everyone, good evening. I don't wanna to take too much time because I know you have a full agenda, but I'm really happy to be here today. Um, I'm very excited about joining the Dr. Cog team. I've been a partner and a fan of Dr. Cog for a long time and have worked alongside many of the staff that are on board now. Um, so I'm really excited to see where we can take some of these projects um, in the future. And yeah, that's about it. Thank you for having me. Thank you and welcome. Uh, go ahead, Doug. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that opportunity. So the, the, the Regional Air Quality Council, uh, Council met on June 3rd 
And um, I know I say this all the time, but we had a, a presentation on the development of the state implementation plan. We actually talked about the final two elements uh, that, that, are, that were left to discuss, which are monitoring and contingency measures. Um, the board is anticipated to take an action on the draft uh, SIP in, at, at their August meeting, and then it will then uh, proceed to the legislature for final, legislature for final approval. Um, in January. So it's all good news. And I just, I, I just want to relate to you the tremendous work that that RAC staff does. They do. It's a lot, a lot of work. They get a lot on their plate right now and so appreciative of all their efforts. Um, we had a kind of a legislative debrief after this was just after the legislative session talking about some of the air quality environmental uh, related bills. And that was about it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, next up is E-470 Authority, Director Mulvey. I'm pleased to report that there's no report at this hour because our last meeting occurred before the last board meeting and our next meeting is tomorrow. So I'll see you next month. All right, great, thank you. Uh, next up is a report from CDOT, uh, Director White. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. Uh, four things to note tonight, and I'll start with a uh, thank you to the board for accommodating the uh, change in the stack schedule. Uh, Director Maurer, I will miss seeing you um, at the stack meetings. We worked together for a long time, and it was sort of nice to see you come back uh, into the, the CDOT building. Um, but Director Williams, I look forward to working with you as well. So thank you again to the board for accommodating a change that helps us quite a bit on the CDOT end. A uh, few other things just to, to note about three weeks ago, we announced a new series of grant awards for the Revitalizing Main Streets programs program. And I wanna acknowledge the four communities, uh, I think I got all of them in the Dr. Cog region that received money. Uh, that'd be Boulder for Colorado Avenue, Commerce City for 68th Avenue, Inglewood for a Hawk signal at Broadway and Lakewood for the 40 West Art Line. And again, that is a grant program that really tries to improve uh, pedestrian and bicyclist safety, access to transit um, along many of uh, the main streets across the uh, state of Colorado. Uh, third and fourth thing I'll note is just a couple of relevant things that were before our Transportation Commission today. Uh, they met today in workshop and tomorrow in full session. They did uh, receive a, a, a briefing today on some proposed changes to the policy directive that you all talked about earlier tonight on greenhouse gases. This is the mitigation measures policy directive. Um, we have uh, been continuing to try to make that the most, most accurate, most comprehensive um, set of measures that we can uh, to give uh, Dr. Cog, North Front Range, CDOT and our other partners in this um, as many options as we can to reach those mitigate or reach those greenhouse gas reduction targets. So I anticipate the commission will uh, approve those amendments tomorrow, um, but I think they uh, were helpful additions to the document. And the last piece I'll note is the commission did here today an update on the I-270 project. Uh, this is one of our um, most significant sort of major corridors on our plan and we are moving forward uh, to address eight bridge structures along I-270. There are four pairs of bridges that are really in poor shape. Uh, so we briefed the commission today on and asked for their support to deliver that project through an alternative delivery mechanism. And there's a required uh, outreach as part of that decision. That is my report for this evening. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Director White, appreciate it. Uh, the uh, last item on reports is uh, fast tracks from uh, Director Van Meter. I think we've heard from Susan and anything else would be redundant on that. So uh, thank you. Next is administrative items. And the next, the only administrative item we have is that the, our next meeting is July 20. We plan for that to be down on uh, in our offices uh, on the first floor conference room. Uh, but just keep your Keep your eyes peeled on your email for any updates on that. Doug, you'll keep us informed and we'll keep an eye on what the, uh, uh, what the uh, level of transmission is in the metro area. Uh, are there any other matters by members? I'm looking around, I don't see any. Uh, having said that, we have no further business on the agenda. So this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you everybody for your flexibility and the quick turnaround.
to this Bye -bye. Uh, virtual <laughs> Thank you. Good meeting. Good night. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Everybody. Good night, everybody. Be safe. Good job. Good night.